Hey guys, what's going on? I know it's been a while, but today we're going to be ranking techniques from Grappler Baki. The criteria is a little, um, I guess it's it's not too organized, there's no kind of standard, but uh, I'll, I'll basically explain the tiers to start us off. We have, of course, trash tier, those are techniques that aren't really great, and we'll be looking at all the techniques featured across the entire series. According to the Baki Wiki, there are about 135 of them, so we'll be looking at those. Also, if you guys are looking at this right here, it's because there's no picture of Nomi's uh, stance of the Kogoken or the Kogo Rikishi. So I, I found a picture of the Kogo Rikishi himself uh, or a statue of him from, from real life. So that's what that's supposed to be. But in any case, like I was saying before, we have trash tier. Those are uh, techniques that are pretty useless or if they're not useless, they're for one reason or another, not great techniques. And then as follows, of course, we have average techniques. They're fine. They're just nothing special. Good techniques, those are pretty good. You know, they either have some cool effect, their, you know, drawbacks are limited, or they're really easy to pull off, something like that. Then you have great techniques. They're like a cut above the rest. They're actually really useful. And if you're able to land them, then they do devastating damage, or they're really easy to land even if they're not that devastating. And of course, god tier techniques. We're looking at things that are like borderline magic. Um, and the, the scope at which we'll be looking at this is if an average person tried to pull them off. For example, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to pinch later on, the pinch technique. Um, but if the average person tried to pinch somebody else during a fight, it wouldn't be that effective. So pinch is probably going to end up in trash tier. So that's the kind of mindset we'll be walking into this through now that's not to say that all the magic stuff like i said magic stuff like key stuff and like special the, the stuff that borderlines on supernatural powers in baki the stuff that ends up in god tier essentially we will be counting that as it appears in baki rather than if somebody tried to pull it off in real life because the assumption is that while this person is normal our stand-in person so to speak right our average Joe who is trying to attempt each of these techniques, while he is a normal person in terms of statistics, the assumption is that he is able to successfully pull off any of these techniques, right? So it's not so much about whether or not he can actually do it. It's more so about how difficult would it be to pull off? What is the, so like the success rate of, of using the technique, um, things like, what is the effect of using the technique? Is it worth, you know, actually trying to use a special technique? Stuff like that. Uh, so like I said, something like Pinch, yeah, it wouldn't be too great because he doesn't have like super strength like, for example, Yujiro. However, something like uh, Aiki, it would work as shown in Grappler Baki rather than as it's shown in real life, which is not always the most effective technique. Typically speaking, Aiki practitioners are better at choreography than they are fighting. Uh, that is not to say that Aiki doesn't work in real life. There are a couple of people in real life that have shown that Aiki does work, but it's probably more difficult to pull off than it's worth considering all the different martial arts, but, you know, I'm not going to get into all that. Right now, we're just ranking techniques from Grappler Baki Explained. I'm not about to get into martial arts politics, which for those of you that don't know, there's a lot of stupid shit going on in martial arts politics pretty much all the time. So, we're going to go ahead and start off with the stance of the Kogo Rikishi. Now, from what I'm thinking about in my head, it's a pretty good stance. Uh, he's got a, a hand low, which is good for checking things like, I guess, kicks. Typically, kicks are checked with the legs. But, in theory, you could scoop or block a kick with the low hand. You can protect your body. Uh, what else? Uh, you could potentially... Uh, it would make it a bit easier to sprawl a takedown. Um, the high hand, I guess, is good for blocking. Uh, he does have his... You know, his elbow up and to the right of his his head, which is a little, a little weird, but I guess it's not the weirdest thing in the world. Overall, I'm going to say it's average, because uh, it doesn't leave a lot to be desired, but... It's not like the greatest stance to ever be seen in all of the history of mankind. It's a uh, maybe a little less than average technique in terms of like stances. It's no like boxer stance, like the the typical boxer stance. That's a really good practical stance for 
an average Joe to take. You know, you're protecting your face, you have quick access to protect your body. It's very practical. So, I think average is fair. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's trash tier, it has its uses. But, it's not the greatest stance in the world, and it definitely doesn't do enough to end up in good tier. Next up is 0.5 second unconsciousness. I think we can all agree that that is a god tier technique. To put it anywhere else on this tier list would be disingenuous, right? Intellectually dishonest, okay? It allows you to attack somebody in their half a second consciousness delay when their unconscious mind is transferring information to their conscious mind. It's basically like a video game superpower where you get one free hit on the enemy character, all right? If you can pull that off in real life, you can manage some really devastating attacks in a time frame where the opponent cannot defend themselves. Add to that the fact that there are pretty much, both in the series and out of the series, off the top of my head, only three ways you can actually get around the technique, which would be uh, something like the hand pocket, where you can increase the acceleration of your attack rather than just the speed, the ultra high level Sen no Sen that Musashi pulls off where he, you know, performs an action to bait Baki into using 0.5 second unconscious, and then he immediately counters that action that he expects him to take. Something like that would work well, and also something like Ultra Instinct, where you can act without thinking, that would be able to technically counter the 0.5 second unconscious skill because you wouldn't need to consciously register something in order to take action and defend yourself against it. Although when I say that 0.5 or excuse me, when I say that Ultra Instinct would counter 0.5 second unconscious, I do mean that it would have to be something on the level of Ultra Instinct, in that it would have to be a 100% guaranteed instinctive reaction at all times, because both Baki and Yudro have been shown to be able to react without consciously making the effort to do so, but they've also both shown to be hit by this technique. So unless you have a 100% guaranteed instinctive reaction, the technique is going to have some level of success rate. If you can instinctively react to anything at all times with a 100% guarantee, then the success rate of 0.5 second unconscious is reduced to zero because it would basically turn into a normal attack. Which is not bad if you perform a special technique with 0.5 second unconscious, then you'll be able to basically, they, they kind of hard counter each other, so, for Ultra Instinct, if you're going to try to hit somebody who has, for, for example, Ultra Instinct, you know, instinctive reaction, they'll be able to dodge faster because they don't have to consciously register that they're being attacked, they can just dodge. But if you attack during their 0.5 second unconscious phase and you're able to skip your own, like as shown in the technique, then you'll be able to land your attacks because you're basically countering their ability to instinctively react, right? You're hitting them while they would be unconscious, and on the other side, they can react while they're unconscious, so it would just be like fighting normally with no, like, hacks or gimmicks or special powers. Next is the Kachi Age. Uh, I'm gonna say it's average. Uh, it's just a, like, a, a forearm elbow-esque strike. You see it in real life in sumo wrestling. It's, it's a good technique, but, like, in terms of grappler Baki, there's nothing really special about it. It's no different from, like, say, just a, like a normal punch. You know, so Kachiage, it's, it's average, it's just a normal strike. Next is Death Concentration. I'm thinking either, gra uh, well, Great or God Tier. Uh, let's put it in Great right now and kind of talk it out. So, what it does is, in essence, that kind of phenomenon where if you're put in a life or death experience, time seems to kind of slow down, your perception, like, seems to slow down time around you, you're perceiving everything that, like, like, like slow motion, basically. It's because your brain has upped its ability to process things because it senses that it's in a life or death situation. So basically we're getting like a, not actually slowing down time, but more so slowing down your perception of time or increasing your reaction speed. I'd say that's pretty good. It makes it so that, like, an average layman wouldn't be able to hit you, especially for somebody like Baki or, assumedly, Yujiro, who both are able to control when this happens. And yeah, we don't see it mentioned often in the series, but I think the kind of insinuation is that since he unlocked this ability at the age of 13, he's been using it when he needs to without making any mention of actually using it, right? Like, he's not going to say, activating death concentration every time he needs to use it, it's just going to kind of happen. 
right? Just like it did against the Yasha ape. It just kind of happened, right? There was no mention of it actually taking place. We just kind of saw that Baki was perceiving everything in slow motion, which was his payoff from jumping off a cliff backwards. By the way, please, <laughs> please don't try that. <laughs> I see some people say things on the Baki subreddit. Like, does this technique work in real life? Please, <laughs> please don't try this in real life. <laughs> you are not a trained professional, all right? And even a trained professional would die because you're, you're just jumping off of a cliff head first while backwards. You, okay, just don't. Anyway, I think I want to leave it in great because slowing down your perception of the things around you is good. Being able to see things in slow motion is great. You'll be able to like dodge a lot of stuff. But there are a lot of counters to it, right? You can uh, you can attack outside of somebody's you know visual perception, right? So if you like throw a hook and they're not looking, if you've angled your body in a manner that allows you to throw a hook outside of their peripheral vision, it doesn't matter how slowly they're perceiving time. They might be able to recognize, oh, his arm is kind of like I, I can't see where his fist is because his arm is outside of my peripheral vision, and then realize, oh, he's trying to you know, land a hook on me, or he, oh, he's, like, doing an uppercut outside of my field of vision. But an average Joe, in theory, may not connect two and two. So I think what amounts to uh, a reaction amplification, a reaction speed amplification, I think it sits well in the great tier. By the way, in terms of ordering them, um, I'm not going to do it to begin with. I'm just going to put them in their proper tier. And then at the end of the video, I'll probably cut to, you know, smash cut to when they're all ordered in the way that I think they should be within each tier individually. Now, I will say this moving forward. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned this yet in any other video. I don't know when I'm going to be releasing this video in conjunction to all the other footage I'm sitting on because I've gotten a lot of chances recently to record, but not a lot of chances to actually sit down and edit. Um, because, you know, I have a lot of people living in my house, so I do like to take the chances for when the house is empty or when the house is quiet, I like to take those chances to record because for whatever reason, the, the acoustics in my room are awful. Nobody can hear me out there. I can scream as loud as I want in here and nobody can hear me, but I can hear planes flying like 40 feet above my house or like, that's actually a bad example because you anyone would probably be able to hear that. Like a thousand feet above my house, I can hear choppers and planes. I can pe hear people out on the street like or on, on different roads in my neighborhood. Anyway. I say that to say, just recently I got a job. Uh, I, I work like 16 hours a week. It's not that bad, but Wednesday is my only day off. And right now I'm recording this on Thursday. Now Thursday is the day that I close, so I have time to do stuff earlier in the day. But right now I'm running the clock because I have other things to do today. So you'll have to excuse me if I kind of rapid fire lightning round through these techniques. But let's go ahead and place adrenaline. I thought about this a little while ago. Uh, I think I'm going to put it in great tier for a similar reason that I put death concentration in that it increases your speed, your endurance, you know, your your aggression, all those things. It's just a flat statistics boost, but we don't really know how strong it makes you. We just know that it makes you a lot stronger, a lot faster, a lot more aggressive, stuff like that. So we'll just put it in great tier because, I mean, <laughs> if the scene from the most recent Batman movie is anything to go on, where he gets blasted in the chest at point blank range with a shotgun and he's kind of like oh you know he, he can't move he's rocking and he's like he can't even bring himself to stand up and then he shoots that adrenaline into his leg like an epinephrine pen and he gets up and he turns the guy's face in a ground beef yeah if that if it, that's anything to go based off of also of course Gaia's own performance against Baki when they fought adrenaline is pretty good but I, I wouldn't say it's like god tier it just makes you a lot stronger and a lot faster. It's not like a super power boost all of like Super Saiyan or something or like Super Sonic. It, it, it just makes you a lot strong. Brain Buster, I'm going to put in good tier. It'll be the first good tier technique and we're starting to fill out. Hopefully I don't have to fill out this tier too much, but we are starting to fill out our tiers, which is nice. In any case, Brain Buster goes in good tier because it's a bit of an above average technique. It's a grappling technique, which tend to be better than striking techniques. Now, I'm personally preferential to striking techniques and striking in general, but grappling is more difficult to deal with for those that don't know how to do anything. You know, an amateur can get lucky and block a strike or even knock out a professional, but with grappling, it's 100% skill. 
So grappling techniques do tend to be better, but not only is this a grappling technique, it's a pretty easy grappling technique to get off because you pretty much only need like a headlock, and then you immediately slam the person's skull into the ground. Now, it's a pretty one-note technique, kind of like the kachiage. It's, a, it's like a normal technique that people use in real life, but trust me when I say, if you pull this off on somebody while on concrete, you can potentially kill a person just using this one technique. It's extremely dangerous to use in real life. You can compress the spinal cord, cause permanent brain damage. So, well, I wouldn't say it's great. It's not like turning you into like Neo from the Matrix, like with death concentration. And it's not making you like a superhuman in terms of strength and speed with like adrenaline. It is something that could potentially greatly damage your opponent just with a single technique. Next is the Shikari stance. I'm actually, I'm going to put this average, but I, I do have plans to put it on the uh, higher end of average because it's a pretty basic stance in that you can pretty much you can pretty much only do two things from the stance normally. I bet somebody that was very fast or a very good fighter could shoot forward from the shikari stance and kick, but there are better stances if you're trying to kick. You can either run right into the person and strike, like with a hand strike, or with like a headbutt, because sumo wrestlers do tend to do that. Although, I think the main point of the shikari stance is to grapple, right? You're going to shoot in on somebody. It's like a wrestler shoot. Uh, you're gonna you're going low, you're charging forward, and you're gonna grab the person and slam them to the ground. So it's a pretty one-note technique. It's also a bit telegraphed. You can kind of tell just by looking at it what the person intends to do. And while it does kind of cut off kicking as an option, you still have a couple of options in the form of like a level change strike where you charge in low, but then you hit high, you can hit mid, you can follow through and hit low, or you can grapple the person and slam them to the ground, or just do whatever you want to do from that position. So it's a pretty good stance, but it's nothing special. You know, nothing good enough to get into good tier. Shining Wizard, I'm actually going to put in average. It's a pretty good technique because you like springboard off of the person's like thigh, and you knee them in the face. Any technique where you knee somebody in the face is a devastating hit, and unlike like a, a for example, a Muay Thai clench into knees to the face, that's kind of a two-step thing, where you can sink that clench, but at that point, the person can put their arms up to block, they can, you know, move you around, they can whip you around in the clench, they can try to break free of the clench. There are a lot of things that can go wrong from the clench position, if the fighter you're going against knows what he's doing, but with this, you just, you know, if, they're, if you're in a position to get your foot on that thigh and spring yourself up, that's a free knee to the face, pretty much. I mean, the person can dodge, but that's... That's going to be a pretty difficult thing to dodge considering the spectacle of somebody springboarding off of your thigh. But that's why I'm putting Shining Wizard in average tier. It's because it, it was that thing I mentioned earlier. It's like, yeah, I'm gauging these based off of effect, but also how easily it would to be like to get this move off. You know, the success rate of actually landing this, it would be very difficult to get in a position where you could actually use a person's thigh or knee as a springboard and most people aren't going to fall for like a blind jumping knee. Jumping knees typically work better in situations where, for example, somebody is shooting in. Take, for example, Jorge Masvidal versus Ben Askren. He knew that Ben was going to shoot in because Ben is like a 100% wrestler. So as soon as he shot in, he went for the flying knee and that ended the fight. There's also one I saw just recently. I was watching a Jesse Encamp video uh, where he reviewed some of uh, Lyoto Machida's greatest knockouts with Lyoto Machida, and there was another instance where a guy like rushes forward to grab him or strike him, something, I can't remember the context, but Lyoto responds with a flying knee, and I'm not sure if it got him the knockout, but it was definitely a devastating strike. That's probably the one thing you can always confirm about a flying knee, is that if it lands, it's devastating. But the Shining Wizard in particular is definitely a bit difficult to get off. It's like, there are a lot less things that can go wrong in between the startup of the technique and the impact of the technique, the knee to the face, in comparison to the Muay Thai clench into a, a high knee. But the Muay Thai clench into a high knee would likely have a vastly superior uh, success rate. It'd be a lot easier to actually get off, right? So it has a, an effect that would 
probably land in good tier, you know, a knee to the face is always a, like a devastating strike, but because of its difficulty to actually land the technique, or actually find the opportunity to use the technique, it's going to end up in average. Shinken Shirahadori. <sighs> okay, this is where, in, in real life, the Shinken Shirahadori, I think, is a trash tier technique. It's originally from Jujutsu. Uh, and it is, it is just a technique that allows its users to catch a blade with their bare hands. Time and time again, it's been seen that this technique is... I don't want to say impossible to pull off, because we don't know anything for sure, but extremely difficult at the very least to pull off, practically impossible for most people uh, to, to catch a blade with their bare hands and then be able to, you know, while, while that blade is trapped, such as in the case with Dopo versus uh, Dorian, move that blade out of the way and then strike the person, you know, with a kick, or maybe you um, throw their leg out of the way, you scoop their leg after you catch the blade, or actually, <laughs> sorry, that's only in the instance with Dorian versus Dopo. Normally, the person would be holding the blade. So, same thing, you kind of move the blade out of the way and you can strike them with your hand, with your foot, you can grapple them from there, anything you need to do. In real life, catching the blade is nigh impossible, but like I said earlier, we're acting under the assumption that these techniques work that all of these techniques work as seen in Baki. With that in mind, it goes to good tier. A blade is a very devastating weapon. It can cause extreme bodily harm, uh, be it cutting through flesh, bleeding you out, uh, puncturing or slicing through internal organs, all that stuff. Yes, indeed, internal organs, not, uh, it's fine. Uh, so being able to catch a blade with your bare hands you're grappling that blade and you're you're basically taking away their one weapon because uh, I won't get too much into it. Like I said, I do have to get to work soon. But typically when people have weapons, they tend to only rely on said weapons. People that are trained to fight with weapons, such as a knife or a gun, will likely take advantage of the other parts of their body. Like you'll go in and try to stab the person with a knife, they try to pass the knife and you can hook them or you can punch them in the face or kick them or anything like that. But people who are not trained, they say, I have a knife in my hand, this knife can kill the other person very easily, so I'm only going to try to attack them with the knife. It's just a psychological thing that people get in their minds that they're basically invincible with that weapon. But as Bunchichi Tanba said in Garudin, the better weapon doesn't expressly guarantee victory. So with that in mind, people who tend to use weapons tend to also leave themselves wide open and only attack with that weapon. So you know if you're fighting somebody with a knife, instead of having to worry about him punching you with one hand or the other or kicks or anything like that, all you've got to worry about is that knife. He's going to try to stab you with that knife, and that's going to be both his greatest strength, because that knife can kill you, and his greatest weakness. So, in an average situation, Shinken Shirahadori, which seals off that knife, it makes it so that that knife or that sword or whatever becomes a weapon that they can't use for a brief period of time, that is an insanely good technique you are basically canceling out not only a very powerful and dangerous weapon, but what is essentially to that person, psychologically speaking, their only weapon. So Shinken Shirahadori goes in good, and here we have uh, Shumei Kano's Shodan. I'm gonna put that in average. Now the Shodan in of itself is just one single punch. There's nothing wrong with that. Some people are able to finish fights in a single punch, but as we see in Kano's style, he is like 90% defense, 10% offense, and the problem with that is, he doesn't do combinations. He does his showdown, and that's it. That's literally the only attack he does. It's a single punch. It gets super predictable. It's super easy to deal with. And most people can't win fights with a single strike. So, <laughs> it's fine. A single punch is not a bad thing. It's fine. It works. Uh, most people that you'll encounter in real life are not used to being uh, hit in the face. The pain of being, like, punched... Uh, there's a joke in the martial arts community that if you're fighting somebody that does Taekwondo, uh, if, if you just punch that person in the face, they're kind of just going to freeze up because they've never been punched in the face. That's not something that humans are innately used to. So being struck is like, that's something you have to get used to. You're going to freeze up. Your brain's going to kind of, you know, malfunction. It's going to start shutting down. It would be like that scene from SpongeBob when... All the Spongebobs in his brain were running around trying to get rid of all the files or trying to save all the files while his brain was on fire. It's, it's like that. Your brain just doesn't really know what to do. It's trying to process what just happened. But the problem is, with Kano's uh, Shodan, you're striking them once and that's it. 
So you're actually hurting yourself by giving them time to process what happened because you don't do combinations. You just punch once and that's it. And then you punch once and then that's it. So not a bad technique. It's a punch. Its weakness lies in the fact that it is just a punch. Single leg figure four. Uh, I want to say it's good. I want to say it's good. It's pretty impressive. I mean, a figure four leg lock is pretty difficult to pull off, but the way he does it in the series, um, Grappler Baki, it shows you when he performs it on Igari. He shows you the entry, so it's a kick defense. You know, he's got Igari's leg. If, if Igari went to have, like, kicked him, you grab the ankle, you loop your leg around, you tuck the foot into the crook of your knee, and you twist backwards, right? You've got the leg in there. All you have to do is finish securing the figure four by putting your foot over the person's thigh. So he was able to develop this single leg figure four in the blink of an eye, right? Regularly, the, the technique is a figure four leg lock, but he just creates this modified version of it. That's more so impressive on the part of Baki, but it's a great submission. It seems pretty easy to pull off. Uh, the only problem is you do need your hand to secure the other person's leg. So that leaves them with two free hands, whereas you only have one free hand. But you have their leg in that submission, and that's not a very comfortable position at all. So not only do they have to, like, reach across the entire length of their body to even try to attempt to hurt you, which is difficult to do because you're using your foot to secure their thigh. It stops them from moving their leg, but it also stops them from being able to move their hips forward to actually be able to reach you and hit you. But you'd have to do that while being submitted. It's very difficult to uh, actually do anything while experiencing that kind of pain. So it's a good technique. You know, you just kind of get that leg in that submission. You got you got your leg lock. You've got your, your pressure. It kind of speaks for itself. It's a pretty good technique. Slap is going to be the first one that goes into trash tier. Uh, it's <laughs> it's just a slap. I don't really think that that needs any further explanation. Even in the series, a couple of times it's used offensively for like as an actual attack. But even in the scene that we're seeing here, where Baki uses it against Pickle, it's such a weak attack that it's used to taunt the enemy, to infuriate them. Like uh, how I think Hoist did against Kimo. In Grappler Baki, Hoist Gracie's stand-in versus uh, the the fighter Kimo. Uh, I think that was it. That was the explanation they used uh, in the Pickle versus Baki fight as to why Baki slapped him. But it's it's used more so as a taunt because it's not a powerful technique. So it's it's gonna be our first one in trash tier. The sleeper hold. This is another good one. Okay, it does depend on how good you are at applying it. For example, Mount Toba here. Uh, you can watch, um, I can't remember, I think it was Baki versus Ali Jr. Scenic Fights. Scenic Fights did a video uh, talking about Baki versus Ali Jr. And one of the things they talked about is the fact that if you put your hand on top of the person's head, they can grab your hand and pull it forward or even pull it to the side, for instance. And you can no longer really apply the pressure to the carotid, which causes the person to go to sleep as the name sleeper hold would suggest but as applied here the person would have to know you know they, they would have to stop panicking because they're being choked out they have like what seven seconds before they lose total consciousness they they're kind of panicking so they're probably not thinking straight so an untrained person probably wouldn't think to grab your hand and pull it forward because they wouldn't they'd be trying to understand the mechanics of how they're being choked while being choked while not being used to being choked so there's that kind of triple threat dichotomy there. So while this isn't the best example of a sleeper hold, I'd say it's a good technique because it's going to work on your average layman, and this Joe Schmo that we're using as our stand-in should be able to pull off the technique to great effect. Okay, apologies for the, the cut there. Usually if I'm cutting, it's because I'm taking a, a moment to think about something or I've got to leave for a second for whatever reason, but... This cut was because I, I couldn't recognize what this technique was supposed to be based off of the picture, but this is supposed to be the soccer ball kick, and if that's the case, uh, I don't know if to put it in good tier or average. I'm I'm gonna say, meh. okay, I'm gonna go with good tier. I know this is kind of contradicting what I said about Shining Wizard, but the qualities are a bit different, right? Yes, they have the same 
uh, general thing of like, oh, this is a great technique in effect, but it's hard to pull off, but it, for different reasons and the, the balance is a bit different, that's kind of the difference between it being average and good. For example, with Shining Wizard, as I said, it's kind of, it's basically not impossible. Again, I won't say it's impossible, but it's extremely difficult to springboard off of somebody's thigh or kneecap or even get in a position where you could do that. But with the soccer ball kick, the only requirement is that the person is on the ground and you are not. That's actually a really easy um, requirement, prerequisite to meet, right? You could throw the person to the ground, you could kick the person, the person could have just fallen. You can push the person and they stumble, they could lunge and stumble, they could shoot in and fall over. There are thousands of ways that a person could end up on the ground. Not so many ways that a person ends up with their leg out to be used as a springboard, especially in that position specifically. And when you get the person on the ground, there's a reason that the UFC does not allow for soccer ball kicks, especially to the head. They're really powerful. You're going to give your opponent brain damage. Kicks are incredibly powerful, and you are kicking a person while they're on the ground, so you're kicking their head with the full weight of your body, because in order to do a soccer ball kick, you have to leap off of one foot. So you're using the entire weight of your body and kicking somebody right in the face. They are... They are absolutely devastating, at least with a uh, with a Shining Wizard, right? The effect is kind of reduced a bit because you have to jump, so you're working against gravity. But Mother of God <laughs> is a soccer ball kick absolutely devastating. There's a reason that Okubo almost, or yeah, he almost killed the opponent that he used a soccer ball kick on. He soccer ball kicked somebody in the head. He almost killed him. And th that it's because it's such a nasty uh, effect. Not only that, but it's not difficult to pull off because it's just a kick. You, it's like a, it's kind of like the crane kick, right? Where you jump off of one foot and you kick with the other. It's basically that same thing, but much easier to pull off, much more devastating. Uh, it's just a better technique, and it's it's actually pretty good. If not for the fact that the person had to be on the ground, if not for the fact that it had a prerequisite, despite the fact that it's a basic move, I might actually even put it in great tier. But because the person does have to be on the ground and as devastating as the strike is, it doesn't have any special, almost kind of anime-like effect. Uh, it doesn't really warrant anything to get to great tier. Not to say that near-death uh, focus, you know, death concentration or adrenaline, they are, you know, anime-like because they are real phenomena. But the way they're used in the anime is a bit hyperbolized. It's a bit exaggerated, which, of course, is something we've come to expect in Baki. I mean, hell, 0.5 second is something that that occurs in real life as i've explained in my grappler baki techniques explained video uh go ahead and watch that uh, shameless plug but again like death concentration and adrenaline uh, 0 0.5 second it's not something you can skip right like the way that baki does it's not something you can just oh if you're skilled enough in martial arts you can just skip a 0 0.5 second unconscious phase no it happens to everybody all the time and there's nothing you can do about it in any case, uh, yeah, I think good is a good place for the soccer ball kick. Next is the Sakuto. I think I'm going to put this in average. Um, it's good because using the blade of your foot is a more narrow surface than like using the top of your foot. Uh, it's a little bit easier to pull off because uh, there's more to the blade of your foot rather than say the heel, which is the hardest part of the foot, or the ball of your foot, which is what most people use. That's a smaller area than a, a Sakuto, than the blade of your foot. But, you know, your average Joe is not going to cut a person like Dopo's, uh, uh, Dopo Sakuto do. He's only cutting people because he's like this master of martial arts, right? He's so good, he's so precise with his kicks that he's able to cut the person, right? But your average Joe, it's just going to be a normal kick. And they have their uses. You can kick the soft spots on a person's body. Uh, but also, you know, you can use them to check kicks. Uh, that's pretty good. You know, you get the Sakuto on a person's kneecap uh, and they can't move forward. You know, a person tries to kick you, you can do it like a side kick, a Yokogiri Sakuto side kick, um, you know, blade foot. Uh, so, so, I mean, it has its uses, but, you know, used by an average Joe, it's not really that much better than an average kick. You know, it's just a different way of kicking. Spear tackle. This is going in good tier. Uh, this is basically Baki's answer to, like, a shoot-in, like a wrestler shoot-in. It's, it's, a, it's a certified hood classic. I don't know what to tell you. I mean... 90% of fighters you see in UFC use it. Uh, most fights feature a spear tackle in one way or another, be it successful or not. Uh, it's just a good way of getting a person to the ground, and more often than not, 
for one reason or another, that's where a lot of fights end up. They end up on the ground. So, it's a great way to take care of a striker who doesn't know how to manage distance. Uh, it's, a, it's a great way to just kind of get your opponent on the ground for like a ground and pound or something. Uh, the opponent being on the ground is probably the most vulnerable position a person can be in. That's why arts like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, Judo, wrestling, that's why they're so good. Because it teaches you how to fight in this vulnerable position. So being on the ground with your opponent having a dominant position, that's probably one of the most dangerous places you can be. And the spear tackle across all of human history, the spear tackle is probably the easiest way to get a person onto the ground. So this... This is probably one of the best real-life martial arts uh, skills that's featured in Grappler Baki, like a skill that real people use in real life. Spear Tackle is probably one of the best ones. Stomp, it's a... Uh, it's a classic. Again, it suffers the same problem as the soccer ball kick, but to a lesser effect, I mean, you're kind of stomping down on the person, and you're just repeatedly stomping over and over and over. It's, it's good. It probably exerts even more power than the soccer ball kick, but the fact that it's not as refined makes it more predictable. Also, there are probably a lot of moves across many different grappling and ground martial arts that feature defense against being stomped because it's such a basic technique. So it's kind of like soccer ball kick light, where it's a little stronger, but it kind of leans in the same direction as well. Maybe not, maybe not in the sense that it's more difficult to pull off, but there's a lot more that a person can do about being stomped on than they can do about just getting soccer ball kicked in the face. The Sunke, this is absolutely... I'll say this is a good tier, and spoiler alert for a, a later feature, I'll probably say the Musunke is probably in the great tier. I'll say that this is in the good tier because, I mean, it's, it's, it's probably one of the single strongest strikes in the series. Like, it's like Shodan on crack. You can strike the person from extremely close range. For example, I've watched a lot of videos talking about how to use the one-inch punch, which is what this is, the Sunke, the one-inch punch practically, and for example, it's great for grappling situations where you're really close to a person, you're maybe in the clinch or something, or the person's trying to get a grapple on you and you're a striker. It, it allows you to generate a lot of power in a short distance. Now, Baki does take its liberties in that it sends a man flying, you know. Uh, unless, like, for example, if you look at Bruce Lee's uh, Long Beach demonstration, if a person is standing square, it absolutely will knock them back, right? And by standing square, I mean both feet are equal distance forward and to the side. Uh, but if a person has one of their legs back, like most fighting positions feature, uh, they're going to be able to shift their weight to their back leg, and it's not going to knock them back as far. It's not going to be this devastating strike that defeats a man in a single punch. But looking at how it's featured in Baki, which is a more exaggerated version of what you can expect in real life, it's a really good punch. It knocks Baki like 20 meters away when he's struck with it. That's a lot of... That's a that's a big distance. Uh, and of course, the, the strength of it is enough to one-shot Katsumi, who in of himself is incredibly powerful, even at that stage in the series. I mean... Yes, he did just get finished with a, you know, a really brawling, knuckle-dragging fight with Hanayama, but assuming he was even able to recover in the slightest, that means the Sunke, in a single strike, was able to do more damage to Katsumi than Hanayama was able to do in their entire fight. He was able to knock him out in a single strike. That level of power, and to that effect, in that you create distance within a short distance, you can get really close to the person, and then you knock them like a thousand feet away, it just has a lot of upsides. It's a very devastating technique. So I'd say that the Sunke is a, a pretty good technique. Next is the Suplex. And I think this one also deserves a good tier for the same reason that the Spear Tackle does. Again, it's an age-old classic technique. You get the person's back and you slam their skull right into the ground. You know, it's very similar to the Spear Tackle in its uh, efficacy in real life. And it's similar to Brain Buster in its effect. You know, it's... I won't say it's as easy as the Spear Tackle to actually successfully do. It's probably got a lower success rate than the Spear Tackle. But it's not that difficult to get a person's back, especially if they don't know how to defend against having their back taken. And then they're subsequently introduced to the concrete head first, which can very easily result in their death. So, suplex, age-old classic, it's a good technique. Swayback, another good technique from real life. Um, I mean, Muhammad Ali is known for having popularized this, his kind of uh, no-guard style dodging of strikes. And, oh, you know, in Baki, it works on hand strikes, kicks, 
grapples. It's it's a universal defense, right? It's a complete martial arts defense. So while I wouldn't put it in great tier, because at the end of the day, it's just uh, skillful dodging. It's a technique that teaches you how to pull, which a pull is that backwards motion to dodge something. Um, it's an invaluable asset to any martial artist's uh, repertoire, their, their arsenal, right? Uh, if you can dodge on the level of something as sway back, then... Well, I don't think you're as set as if an average Joe had the abil ability to uh, activate bullet time. You know, if you can manage sway back, yeah, you're pretty set for a fight. You're probably going to be doing a lot of avoiding being struck. and at the Or, or even in this case, because we know it works against grapples in uh, Baki, uh, you're going to avoid being kicked, punched, or grappled. You're pretty set. Not to say it has a 100% success rate. It's not as good as something like s seeing in slow motion, but... It's good for what it is. It's it's good. Next up is the tackle. Uh, I think this is basically uh, a Walmart brand version of the spear tackle. Uh, you could do like a shoulder check. You can do the same thing you do here. But the spear tackle is a little bit better because you get a running start, which means there's more force behind it. But um, the tackle is just kind of it's okay. It's average. You know, people do it in real life. It's pretty effective. Not quite as effective as... It's kind of like the same relationship between the Sunke and the Musunke, which I'm going to put in great. Uh, the Spear Tackle is the better version of Tackle, so Tackle goes in average and Spear Tackle goes in good. The Tamashiwari, I'm actually going to put this in good. I expect to see a lot of techniques in good, as we're already beginning to see. But this is good because it's not so much about using this technique. You don't set out to use this technique. You just use this technique when the opportunity presents itself, right? With the Stomp, it's like... Oh, I'm going to use that because he's on the ground, right? But you can only use that when he's on the ground, right? So it's not like you'll be thinking about using the stomp when he's standing up. Or if you want to use the stomp, you have to first get him to the ground. The Temeshiwari only happens when a person's on the ground, but you don't have to think to use the technique. It just kind of happens when you hit a person while they're on the ground. And what the Temeshiwari is in Baki, because in real life it's just, um, I think it means stone trial or something like that. It's something done in martial arts like karate and kung fu as a demonstration. It's their brick-breaking demonstrations, right? You put a lot of bricks together, you put a little bit of space between them, and when you strike the brick, you break the first one, and that force travels through, causing the second one to break, and it's because of the space in between them, right? If you put all the bricks, like, stacked up against each other one by one, you'd have to generate enough force to break all of those bricks in one go. But... If you uh, break the first brick and there's space in between, then your break you just have to um, generate enough force to break each brick individually, and that will keep breaking bricks until that force dissipates. In any case, in Baki, that same mechanic is applied, uh, so that, say for instance, like in the case of Spec versus Hanayama, Spec is stomping on Hanayama. Hanayama's head is above the concrete. Spec's stomp is pushing Hanayama's head down. Every time he hits Hanayama, even if he wasn't stomping, if he was uh, punching, if he was elbowing, whatever the case, every time he hits Hanayama, not only is he hitting Hanayama, but Hanayama's head is then subsequently being set into motion, which is causing his head to collide with the concrete. So he's getting hit in the head from a fist, and then that is causing his head to be smashed into the concrete. So it's just that kind of bounce effect, and that right there... In the UFC, that knocks people out. That that is that has actually killed people before. I remember seeing a news article uh, a couple months ago about a boxer who got into the ring. I, I can't remember the specifics, but I think he was older, or he was he, his record wasn't as good. That's what it was. He had a pretty bad record, and he was going against somebody with a pretty good record. It wasn't like California or something. Everyone was like, these two people should not be fighting each other. They have completely different skill ranges. But the uh, board of being stupid about boxing decisions in California. They have a whole board dedicated to making awful decisions about boxing, apparently. Uh, they decided that it was good. They sanctioned the fight. They sent him out there. He, the, the good boxer, the boxer with the better record, knocked out the bad boxer, or the boxer with the worst record, and at that point he was fine. But he fell, he hit his head against the canvas, and that caused him to die. It killed him. And everyone was like, oh, it's it's because you sanctioned this awful fight. And that's true, but I don't want that boxer with a good record to feel bad because his punches did not kill this man. It was because he fell wrong onto the canvas and that collision 
with his head and the canvas is what caused him to die. And that's basically what Tamashiwari is. It's using a strike to smash somebody into something else, right? So that kind of concept, that can technically be applied while standing up. If you're striking a person while they're against a wall, you're gonna keep smashing them into the wall. For, exa uh, for example, Jesse Enkamp in his most recent MMA fight, he kept getting smashed against the octagon cage and that tore up his back, the poor guy. So that idea, it does require that there be a wall around, but it's not something you really, it's not a technique you really try to pull off. It's just something that happens in fights. And that thing that happens in fights, I'd say it's very good because it's like a normal strike, but it gives you additional damage sometimes, which can be even more devastating than the actual strike itself. Telephone punch. I don't think I really need to do much of an explanation, but it's going an average. It's just kind of like an overhead well, I guess in this instance, an overhead left, but I think in the actual, I think this is mirrored. I think in the anime it was an overhead right. I'm not sure. It doesn't really matter. It's just an overhead punch. It's fine. It's it's kind of like the Shodan where it, it gets the job done. I'd say it's better because you can follow up from there. You can do like a straight from there or whatever. It's, it's not like the Shodan where it's like, it's a single strike and that's it. Uh, if you use this, you can just like follow it up with whatever, but it's just an, uh, an average punch. I guess it's more like, Kachiage, where it's it's like a normal strike, but there's nothing really special about it, so there it goes. Spinning Lotus. Holy crap. Holy crap, this is a good technique. It's a bit difficult to pull off because, you know, Retsu, he does the spring, but he actually... <sighs> okay, I'm going to leave it up there, but I'm going to justify why it's not like a springboard situation because I was taking that into consideration. It's like it's difficult to pull off. Maybe I'll put it in good, but the reason why I'd say that the Spinning Lotus goes in great is because while similarly to the spinning lotus you either have to use the person's leg um as a springboard to to get on their head uh and then you know get into your position or you have to be able to jump that high which normal humans typically cannot jump high enough to you know eclipse the total height of an average person um and technically, I have thought about this before. Technically, you can use this as a, uh, a follow-up to a sprawl. If somebody shoots in for a takedown, you can sprawl the person. And then instead of just taking their back, you take their back and move your way up to their head. You can get your legs around their head like a reverse um, triangle choke, almost. And then from that position, you should be able to pull off a spinning lotus. You just kind of let your body weight fall to one side or the other. But the reason why I've put it in great is because I don't know how Retsu's doing it. I don't know how he's just dislocating people's necks because in real life this would this would absolutely kill someone. <laughs> you 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 grab their neck and then you make it so that you're planting their shoulders so only their neck and their head can move and then you are literally snapping their neck. So that that is that is insane. You know, I, I okay, okay. Here's what I'll do. I'll move it to good because like I just said, in Grappler Baki it only like knocks people out and we did say that we were only going to use techniques as shown in Grappler Baki. So yes, while in real life, you know, something like 0.5 second unconscious, it wouldn't be possible for anybody to use the technique because nobody can skip that phase. It's a biological necessity. Um, this, this in real life would be more devastating. It would go into great tier. This would go down to like trash tier because it's not a technique you could use. Uh, this would go up to great tier in real life, but... We're just going to have to put it in good because it's difficult to pull off and the best you can hope for is a one-hit knockout, which is still pretty good, but maybe not quite as devastating as a one-hit kill. Uh, and there is one defense against it, as we see, because Baki tries to use the Spinning Lotus on... Uh, I almost said Musashi, Jesus. Uh, he does use the um, Spinning Lotus against Retsu and everyone's like, Oh my god, he knows his techniques, he copied his technique after seeing it one time, he's crazy. And then it was like, yeah, I already knew that, I already knew he was crazy, I already knew he was uh, built different, trademark built different. Anyway, and we see that Retsu is able to stop it by, uh, twisting his torso. He moves his torso in the same direction as his head is being moved, so Baki can't really lower his body to complete the spin of the Spinning Lotus. So there is a counter to it, it's kind of hard to pull off, but it's a one-hit knockout, that's pretty damn devastating. Tetrahedron. Uh, okay, uh, this will be under the assumption that there are eight, there are three people who are able to use perfect teamwork that can pull this technique off, right? Like we're under the assumption that this technique is is possible to be pulled off. So we'll up our Joe Schmode from one to three, 
and all three of them are able to perfectly pull off the technique. I'd say it's I'd say it's great. It's perfect teamwork, which, you know, as explained by the mouth, you know, three people that are kind of like meh at martial arts can beat like a world-class athlete like Iron Michael if they have perfect teamwork. Right? So that's perfect teamwork, but also this formation is insane. It's it's one angle, right? So it's not like they're they're next to each other. Right? He can come at him from this angle. He can come at him from the opposite angle. He can come at him from... They're both coming from the front direction. But they're coming at slightly different angles, which splits his focus just so that he might get distracted by something he sees in his peripheral rather than being able to actually do something about it. And then not only do you have somebody behind, which is great. You know, he can only look in one direction at one time. But... He's coming from above as well. Humans, uh, they, they explain this during the Joe Crazier versus Retsu fight, but humans kind of have a delayed reaction to things coming from above because humans, like most animals, are not used to reacting to things attacking from above. You know, left, right, up, or not up, down. You know, left, right, front, back, that's fine. But when you're dealing like, with somebody like Sekibayashi Jun, you know, pro wrestling is a 3D sport, you know, it's... it's uh, it's, it's a little more difficult to react from something coming from above. So not only do we have, you know, two different directions of focus, we have two different angles of focus, two different directions of focus, but also two different dimensions of focus. That's... There's nobody on Earth that would be able to compensate from that. You could have... You could be fighting three toddlers. And if they pulled, like, a, a jack with his godo, you know, fighting... That child fighting the athlete, if they were deciding to bite... And you were fighting like three babies like this, you would die. <laughs> there would be nothing you could do about it. So tetrahedron is a very devastating technique. Its drawback, of course, being in the form that you would have to have perfect teamwork, which is difficult to find. We're just acting under the assumption that they do because the technique wouldn't work otherwise. Um, and you need three people to pull it off. Also, you need somebody who can do this. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand. I don't know why one of the members of the mouth is Spider-Man. Because he's literally able to hold up his body weight just with the tension he's able to create with his fingers and his feet. So that's actually insanely impressive. That's on some Sikorsky type shit. But uh, yeah, that's it's, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Alright, uh, the toe kick. Um, I'm gonna say... Hmm. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say this is good, and I'm actually going to move Sakuto up to good as well. And I'm moving Sakuto because I just realized that I kind of contradicted myself earlier. It's like, okay, the average Joe wouldn't be able to cut, but... Uh, well, using it as it's used in Baki, we've never seen it not cut a person. It's always cut to some degree. The kick has always been sharp enough to cut. So assuming that that's not just Dopo's skill because he's pretty much the only one that ever performs Sakuto, assuming that that's not just Dopo, and that anybody of any, you know, anyone worth their salt and Baki would be able to cut with a Sakuto. I'm going to put it here. Technically, Shibukawa uses a Sakuto on Jack's throat, but it was more of a stomp rather than anything. Uh, same thing with, uh, what's his name? The Shirinji Kenpo user, uh, Kengo Masaki. Kengo Masaki also does, like, a throat chop with his foot, but it's meant more so to be a stomp rather than a than a Sakuto in its truest form. So I'm putting them here for the same reason in that this is compared to being stabbed with a dagger. So in real life, if you tried this, you'd probably break your toes unless you condition them. But if you are able to pull this off as shown in Baki, it's like being stabbed with a dagger or being stabbed with a knife. Now that is attributed to Dopo's skill, but still it should be relatively comparable. Like... How, to com how comparing, like, a 10th Dan Master, of course, to an average person. But, assuming they're able to pull off the technique perfectly, that would assume a, you know, a roughly comparable technique to that of a 10th Dan Master. Same thing with the Sakuto. Most people may not be able to cut with their feet, but assuming that this is a feature of the technique in its perfected form, this is like stabbing somebody with a dagger without actually having a weapon, and this is like cutting somebody with a blade, so... As karate is shown in Baki, you know, as as Dopo mentions to Musashi, this is karate in its truest form because you're making your body into a weapon. And that's devastating. You'd have, like, a knife and you'd have a sword 
with you at all times attached to your legs. So would you believe from the last thing I said, it's been about 48 hours? Uh, yeah, I had to... <laughs> I've, I've gone to work like twice. I, I, The last two times I've gone to work since, you know, when I started this video, uh, I closed two nights in a row. So I had to pause the recording, go to work, come back, didn't feel like doing anything because I closed at like 9. So I get home at about like 9.30. I just want to kind of chill for the rest of the night. And then, uh, then I get up. I start work at 2, but I get up at like 10.30 because I'm lazy. Uh, so I did not have enough time to record before I went to work. So I woke up, just kind of took the, the Friday to, to relax. I uh, went to work, closed. <laughs> didn't want to do anything when I came back. So it is now Saturday. It's two days later. Um... And we're going to pick up where we left off. So let me see. What, what were we on? We were on the three-level attack. That's the uh, technique that Baki performs on Musashi in which he uses, let me see, uh, level change, obviously, because he does a high strike, a mid strike, and a low strike. Uh, but he also uses three modern techniques. He uses his cockroach dash. He uses the jab. And he uses edge control, which is using, like, the edges in your hand to cut when you... When you strike rather than just striking. Uh, this is a really good technique. Um, I think I'm going to put it up here. There are, not a, there are not a lot of downsides. You hit the person three times. Uh, I think all three are in vital areas. You know, you strike the guy in the nose, in like the solar plexus, and in the uh, the groin. Uh, so it's a you know trademark famous Baki nut masher. Uh, but it's... You know, three strikes in the time it takes most people to strike once. Um, you're using the the massive acceleration boost from Cockroach Dash, uh, the acceleration, or the attack that doesn't really need acceleration uh, with jabs. So you've got, like, that double super acceleration thing. Um, you're cutting as well as striking, and you're striking three weak points, and there's no real downside to it. Say a person could actually pull it off, I, I don't see any issues with, with using this move. I, I mean, not not only would it almost always result in a knockout, especially with that groin strike. Now, of course, Musashi does go on to say that if he had struck in the reverse order, if he had struck the testicles up into the pelvis and then struck the um, the solar plexus and then the face, it would have caused a knockout right then and there. So in the way that Baki does it, which is the way we see it, so that's the way that we'll be discussing it, it probably wouldn't knock out like any, I don't know, UFC champions, but pretty much anything short of that level of preparedness to get hit, as well as um, mental tolerance to pain. You know, anyone short of like a UFC level champion, uh, they're going to get knocked out. They're absolutely going to get taken out right then and there. There's not going to be anything they can do about it either, because you're going to be moving faster than anybody anybody on earth would possibly be able to. Because you're using, not only are you jabbing, which is one of the fastest uh, strikes in modern martial arts, but you're using cockroach dash, which in of itself is like an insane acceleration boost. Even if you wouldn't be able to move as fast as, say, Baki, uh, because, you know, he himself has like superhuman speed. Even if you wouldn't be moving as fast as Baki, you'd still be able to accelerate and strike someone before anybody else in the world. There's nobody that can, it, like, in real life, there's nobody that could accelerate faster than Baki is accelerating with the cockroach dash. Okay, toe using. Another another great technique. I, I'll, I'll go ahead and say that it toe using goes right there because I, I talked about this a little bit in my Retsu feet video. And no, it wasn't a video about Retsu's feet. It was a, a video about Retsu's feats in the series. By the way, go check that out if you haven't watched that already. Shameless plug, shameless plug. Anyway... Um, in the video, I talk about how devastating it would be to fight somebody who has complete mastery over four different limbs to use in combat. Now, you might be saying, oh, well, you know, even normal people can kick. Yeah, but normal people can only grab with their hands. So in that instance, oh, you know, you just have to worry about the person's hands if you want to avoid being grappled. But imagine getting ankle picked by someone's toes. If you're close enough, if you're at mid-range, you can probably see their feet in your peripherals. But if you're in close range, like for example, grappling range, clinching range, stuff like that. If you're that close, then you can't see their feet in their peripheral or in your peripherals. 
So they could grab your, I don't know, your ankle or your pant leg or something like that. They could grab that with their toes and ankle pick you. And you're, you've are you been taken down and you didn't even realize it because their hands are up here. You know, their hands are guarding their face or their torso. So you're thinking there's no possible way you can be grappled, right? Somebody could hook your ankle, but that's more of a I'll deal with it when I need to situation or I'm ready to react. But being heel hooked or swept and then having your leg or your pants grabbed by someone's toes and pulled away that's a very different kind of sensation that's a very different thing or in terms of how you would react to that so that's insane also with the fact that they can grapple you from pretty much any body position it's just there's no real downside to toe using and it's such a it's such a game changer right now they they have to stay at mid or long range because they risk getting grappled in places that they can't do anything about with toe using. All right, Triceratops Fist. I think we're getting to the stage where... Uh, well, you know what? Okay. It's a very powerful technique. It's extremely powerful. And, um... How would I say that? Okay. It's extremely powerful. It's extremely devastating in its impact. But the stance you have to take in order to perform the technique... Somebody could, in theory, attack you while you're preparing to take that stance. That's the problem with stance-based techniques, right? We're not, you know, we're not Baki with superhuman levels of reaction speed or or anything like that. This is supposed to be an average Joe kind of just regular stand-in, right? A faceless nobody who's able to perfectly perform any one of these techniques. You can perfectly perform the Triceratops Fist and still get, for instance, taken down or thrown while you're taking that that triceratops stance so it's good when i do order these in like how good they are i'm probably gonna have it end up closer to the top if not one of the best in the good tier it's just shy of great tier but that single instance in the stance where he's taking that stance rather than attacking i don't know maybe maybe you'd be able to use it effectively at the start of a fight because you take the stance before the opponent has a, a chance to cover the distance. You know, he closes the distance or, you know, a chance before he's able to, you know, roll his knee so that he can kick. You know, anything like that. I'm sure it'd be fine there. But the difference between the Triceratops Fist and, say for instance, the Spear Tackle, the only real difference is the power output. So I would say, like, the Triceratops Fist is technically like a better version of the spear tackle because I, I mean i know with the spear tackle you can grapple which is not really something you can do with the triceratops fist but the difference between the power output is night and day right baki was producing enough energy and this is like a, a kind of narrative low ball right like in the narrative of baki with their feats and statements they're like superhuman gods but they try to keep the series more grounded within the narrative like oh all of a beat the the deadlift you know 500 kilograms deadlift that's impressive but that's nowhere near as impressive as he's shown to be you know he didn't struggle with that feat he's shown to be able to uh prevent a 17 ton helicopter from taking off so that's not the upper echelon of his strength but that feat was mentioned because you know that was the world record in real life uh so it seemed impressive because it was more tangible to us uh by that same token uh, you know, Baki being able to output, I don't know, he's like 70 kilograms, and he's like, oh, uh, you know, Yujiro's like, Baki, you were able to, uh, produce, uh, I don't know, like, 500 kilograms or something nuts, uh, of force because you were pretending to be a Triceratops. I don't know what the ratio is, but if we apply that ratio to an average Joe, you know, you can expect that same level of strength, like, you know, Baki's max level of strength is much higher than being able to topple a car and crumple the side, you know, as he does with the Triceratops Fist, he's shown feats and has scaling to prove that he'd be able to do that, you know, with the flick of a finger. But in the, in the narrative of the story, having done that and having that uh, seen as an impressive feat because that's tangible to us in the real world, like, oh, wow, look, he flipped a car. That's really impressive because people can't do that in real life. I mean, Hanayama was doing that, like, in the kid arc. He literally busted an entire car engine with a single punch. So, you know, like I said... That's nowhere near the upper echelons of his power. It's more just like a an environmental destruction feat to kind of give an example of how powerful, you know, Baki is in a way that's easy for us to to grasp. But still, 
it, if we're saying that's an accurate representation of the kind of output of power that the Triceratops Fist can uh, give you as a bonus, like, oh, you're increasing your, your striking power by X amount because of the fact that you're imagining you're a Triceratops, uh, that, that's extremely devastating. The, 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 uh, the amount of power that you're outputting in comparison to the Spear Tackle is like night and day. So while it's not as versatile, there's not as much utility to it, uh, the starting position and then strike, uh, this is definitely the better version of that. All right, next up is the Sukidashi, and it's pretty average, right? It's a, a palm strike to the, you know, to the body, typically speaking. I suppose you could do the palm strike to the face, but in that we see it, it's a palm strike to the body. So let's, let's pretend for the sake of it that that's the typical use of the technique. It's a palm strike to the to the body uh, that causes a pushing effect, right? The uh, supari, which we'll, we will talk about later, is described as more of a, a slap or like a, a, a shove, I guess. Whereas this is like you make contact, you make heavy contact with the chest, and then you double up and push, right? So in that sense, it, it has more utility than the supari. The supari is more like a than a it's more like a punch, whereas, like, the Sukidashi, I guess you could say, is more like, uh, the Sunke, right? Where, where you strike and then you push, causing the person to be knocked back, so... It's got, like, a little special effect, but it's pretty much a normal strike. It's something that people do in real life, a Sukidashi. Uh, same with, uh, Tsupari. Um, I will also put that in average while we're talking about it. These techniques are pretty similar. I'd say this is definitely the better version of this, but, I mean... At the end of the day, it's just a, a palm strike, you know, a palm thrust. Uh, speaking of which, we have the two-handed thrust, and again, I'd say that goes there. This one is clearly better than, I'd say, both of these, because you're using two hands. Uh, but, I mean, again, it doesn't have any kind of special ability like the, the things up here. You know, you, your special ability, brain damage. Your, <laughs> your special ability, cutting people with your foot, you know. It has all these, you know, impressive kind of second little extra add-on effects, kind of like some, on some, some Dungeons & Dragons class feature type shit. Whereas these, they're just kind of average. You know, there's there's nothing really special to them. Uh, but they're just, they're, they're all right. You know, that's that's why they're average. <laughs> Udonde. 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 I'm, I'm thinking, obviously, either good or great. I'm gonna say great because the fault in it kind of lies with Yujiro's personality rather than with the technique. But basically, the way that this technique is countered is if somebody sets up a counter like Dopo did with the Maeba stance, uh, the front wing uh, stance, Maeba, Maebane Kame or Kama, Kamea, something like that. Uh, I can't remember the, uh, the Japanese pronunciation. But the front wing stance, uh, he, he set up this counter, so basically it was a matter of whoever attacks first is going to be countered, because they both have counters set up. And Yujiro was brash, he was confident, he was aggressive, and he decided to abandon the, Udo the excuse me, the Udonde to attack first. So, logic would dictate that if Dopo had attacked first, Dopo would have been the one that got, you know, countered. So, the reason why I put Udande in great is it's probably one of the best counters in the entire series, right? You can counter any attack from any direction without changing your stance, and it's a surprise attack because the stance, quote-unquote, for the Udande counter is a completely normal walk. So, you appear to have your, your guard down, you appear to be open, your defense is, you know, completely filled with holes, so it baits people into attacking you, at which point you counter them, no matter what attack they use and no matter what angle they attack from, and you can do it all while never changing your position or your stance. That's that's an insane counter system. Like like if if Yujiro just had the patience, or if he had the I mean I, I bet he has the patience nowadays, but he doesn't like relying on things like martial arts techniques, because he, he sees them as cheap tricks. Uh so I mean, anybody with Udande, they would basically be not invincible because there is matters of things like speed and strength. But in a situation that we're describing where, you know, you have your average Joe, I mean, unless he's being attacked by somebody like, I don't know, <laughs> uh, a sumo wrestler like Hakuo, 
or if he's being attacked by, you know, somebody with like a vast weight advantage on him. He's not getting beat. He can't be attacked because he's always going to counter it, just regardless of, uh, you know, from what angle he's being attacked by. I guess if he was attacked by a weapon, there could be... It depends on how he counters, but as you're seeing in the picture here, the way he counters Dopo, uh, you know, a, a knee to the small of it, he, like, dodges it, and then he gives a, a Dopo a knee to the small of his back and an elbow to the throat. In that instance, he'd be under no threat even by somebody with a weapon, so I guess the, the worst possible situation is if he was attacked by enough people... I know Yujiro has that whole speech about how you can really only be attacked from, by four directions. You know, so you can you only have to worry about four people at one time. Um, or it was something like that. I saw in a post recently on Baki that it was seven, seven people at once. I can't remember for sure. That doesn't make sense to me because there's no way it would be an odd number of people. Seeing as, like, the cardinal number of directions is four. You have north, south, south, east, and west. And then you have their... Uh, I can't remember what they're called, but like that, the half uh, directions. So that would be eight. So you know, I, I I don't I don't know for sure, but but I say that to say, I guess maybe if you dogpiled enough people onto an Udande user, they wouldn't be able to counter everyone, especially simultaneously. So in that instance, yeah, I do think that you could get an Udande user, but that's why it's in great tier and not god tier. It's because well, I mean, <laughs> there's only so much you can do in terms of counters, but. You're preventing yourself from being attacked, and you're able to attack the other person. That's basically the essence of martial arts, attack without being attacked. The apnea rush. Uh, okay. We we have confirmation that this technique is only as effective as it is because of Spec's extremely powerful lungs. So I'm going to put that in good tier. Because the average Joe doesn't have the lung power that Spec has. Which means the amount of time that they could consecutively use this would be vastly shorter than specs. Now, that's not to say it's a bad technique. I would never dream of putting it in average. As a matter of fact, it's probably going to be in the higher end of good up there with, say, for instance, Baki's Triceratops Fist. But the weakness lies in the fact that, of course, you would need this massive amount of lung strength. And even if you did have it, I probably wouldn't put it in great tier because, as we saw with Hanayama, well, it can be powered through. You know, with physical power, you can overcome it. Now, that's, you know... That kind of applies to pretty much every technique on this list, save for a couple of really good ones, like, for instance, this one and these two. But, with that little but, that little caveat there, it is an extremely powerful technique because it allows you to constantly strike a person and leave no room for any counterattack, any dodging, any evasion or blocking of any kind. The person just kind of has to sit there and take it. Or rather, they, they would be able to block, but they wouldn't be able to do much beyond that point. If you reach out to try to counterattack the person, you're going to get struck, and your counterattack is going to get flubbed because they're just going to keep pummeling you. So you risk dropping your guard, which in turn would lead to you being pretty much eviscerated, shredded to pieces. And we know that he punches fast enough to like melt bone with the heat he's generating, so... You have to ask yourself if it's worth it to even attempt a counter. But at the end of the day, I mean, you could go for broke because <laughs> at, you're just going to get pummeled. You know, I don't I don't know if you're going to be able to keep your guard up that whole time. And for all you know, the, the onslaught is never going to end. So at the end of the day, it's just about, you know, it's a matter of when, not if. You know, you're, you're going you're gonna to lose your guard at some point. Now, you know, unbeknownst to the, the subject of this horrible... Wushu Lianda, you know, this apnea rush, you could actually outlast the person. You know, this is an average Joe, he doesn't have the lung strength. So you could, in theory, keep your guard up, and then when the person is, you know, exhausted, they're out of breath, you launch your counterattack, but the person that's being hit with this has no way of knowing that that onslaught is ever going to end. Armbreaker. I would probably, I'm going to put this in average, but I would probably put this on the higher end of average, because, I mean, it's a technique, it's a grappling technique, those are always really good, but it's a grappling technique that you can use to break a person's arm. I mean, that's, that's especially in the standing position, you don't even have to put them in an arm bar and, like, get them on the ground. That's, that's pretty, that's pretty good. If you can pull that off, especially against, like, an average, you know, layman, you know, you get attacked on the street by some thug or some delinquent, and you, you bust his arm, that's, that's the end of the fight. 
I, I, that's that's pretty much the long and short of it. It's not like some marvelous technique where you can stab somebody in the abdomen with your toes like a knife, but it is pretty good, you know? I, I'm sure this would do some damage to a delinquent, and I'm, I'm sure, you know, your Shodan, that's gonna at least act as a deterrent for, like, your average Joe, but this, that that's, that's a fight ender right there. Out of all the average techniques, this is one of them. <laughs> Arm lock. Uh, this one is, is another one of those average techniques that I gotta put in good, right? It's like, it's like the spear tackle. It's not special. People do it in real life all the time. Or like the sleeper hold, or when I eventually take on the rear naked choke. It's a technique that people use all the time. It's the arm lock. But that is another fight ender, but to the point that this is pretty much constantly used. Some form of arm lock. Maybe not this exact one, but I mean, it's an arm lock. It's also multi-purpose because i mean like you know bouncers will use it to detain unruly uh patrons and escort them out of the premises police use it i'm sure mps use it uh just it's a very widely used uh utility uh i guess hold submission whatever you want to call it uh it's it's very practical it's very good and i don't think i'd feel comfortable putting it in average because average is a bit of a downplay if i'm being honest it's I think it deserves good tier. I don't know how high into good tier it'll end up, but that's that's not a move to sleep on. Maybe this one, but not this one. So we're like an hour and 30 minutes in at this point. Uh, I might have kind of cut out a couple of things where I've like stuttered over something or I've been trying to think about where to place something. You know, I'll make cuts here and there. But in terms of like live recording, I just checked. We're about an hour in or an hour and 30 minutes in and we've still got quite a few techniques. So. I'm gonna try to maybe speed it up because I feel like I'm probably gonna have to end up doing a part two to this video, which is not bad, but I mean, if I could, I'd like to do it all in one sitting. All right, rope arts, um, good. Uh, long and short of it, it's really effective for restraining and detaining a person. Uh, it's, it's basically like any, you know, submission or choke or whatever, except you don't have to constantly apply it. You can just apply it once and it's applied until you undo it. Because, I mean, look at Retsu. He's not getting out of that. He would not be able to get out of that unless Musashi allowed him to get out of that. Uh, in which he did. But this is, like, it is very, it's very good. The, the only downside, that I would, I would put it in great. Because, you know, it's a one-time, you know, constant restraint. Uh, I would not put it in great because it does require you to have rope on you. You know, any technique in which you have to have something supplementary, I'm probably going to rank it a little bit lower. Okay, the Enzugiri, I'm going to put it in average. Uh, jump kicks, not great. Um, jumping puts you in a very vulnerable position. Anytime you're fighting anyone ever, uh, even if it's just an average Joe, you could slip. Uh, he could actually know what he's doing, and he could, like, sweep your foot while you're landing. He could, I don't know, grapple you. Uh, jumping kicks are notoriously unreliable. They're powerful, but they're notoriously unreliable. Now, that said... If you were gonna kick anywhere, if you if you were gonna kick anywhere and have it be effective, it's gonna be to the back of the like the nape in the neck. Like he, he's pulling some attack on Titan shit here. All right, a kick to the medulla, the medulla cutter, the enzugiri. Uh, that's that's a great place to kick if you did a jump kick. So out of all the jump kicks, uh, this is probably one of the better ones. This is probably gonna end up on the better end of the spectrum, but. Being that it's a jumping kick, I can't in good conscience put it in good tier. Because it's it's a little too unstable. It's too unreliable. Even in the sense that, you know, kind of jumping quickly over to... Where did I put... Uh, yeah, Shining Wizard. Average. Uh, j jumping moves. They're, they're, they're a little a little too unreliable for my taste. Let me see. Did I... Did I... Um, in, in any of these, did I <laughs> contradict myself? I don't think so. I mean, the Sakuto can be done from a planted position. If you want to do it from a jumping position, I think that that's a little different. Because you're, yes, it's a jump kick, which is unreliable, but you're cutting the person. It's not like a normal kick to, like, a vital point like this or like this. You are, like, slicing the person as though you were cutting them with a bladed weapon. That's a little different. All right, uh, the backdrop. Backdrop. Ooh, backdrop goes right here. Goes right here with the suplex, okay? Backdrop is like the suplex. It's a little more difficult to manage, but it's a lot more impactful. Because rather than just slamming them into the ground with, like, a lot of their body weight, you're kind of slinging them into the ground. You are lifting them into the air 
and dropping them with their full body weight, the like full length, the full height of your body. That's it's it's a lot. It's a bit more difficult to actually manage because you got to pick the person up and then drop them over your shoulder. And you drop them off of your back. But damn, if it isn't a devastating attack. Okay, the backhand blow or the back fist. I want to say it's average. Uh, it's a it's a very good move. Uh, it has a lot of practical uses, especially if somebody gets behind you, or if you want to advance your position, for example. Um, you could, you know, swing around and do the back fist. It also works as a kind of pseudo evade. You know, if somebody's shooting something right down center line, if somebody's trying to launch like a straight right, right down the pipeline, uh, you could do a back fist and they will not connect cleanly. Uh, and then you immediately counter by clocking them right across the face with a backhand. It's a good technique. It doesn't really do anything special. You know, nothing like up here where you're like, you know, punching somebody until they melt or like, you know, dropping somebody right onto their skull with your, you know, their full body weight. It's nothing like that, but it's a good strike. For what it is, it's very good. Okay, a back suplex. You know what? I'm actually going to put this here. I never understood this. I never understood the back suplex thing. I think it's a little easier to manage because rather than having to take the back uh, like you have to with the suplex, you can just kind of fold somebody down, right? Like like you have their, their where you're facing each other and you push them downward, you like almost like a sprawl, and then you can wrap your arms around their midsection and then you suplex them backwards. And that's great. They'll land on their back and it'll hurt. It'll be kind of like a throw. But they could also just land on their butt and be fine. I mean, it'll it'll still definitely hurt. It'll absolutely hurt, but it won't be as devastating. Uh, it's nowhere near as devastating as being launched onto your upper back or, God forbid, onto your head, which could kill you. Uh, back suplex is just is just not doing it for me. I think it's on the better half of average, but it's definitely on the worse half of being suplexed. <laughs> it's it's like wow, thanks for suplexing me onto my back and not onto my fucking neck. Okay, the ball. I don't think that, um... Uh, yeah, okay. I, I don't think it's it's a bad technique. It's it's very good. It's one of the best defensive techniques in the series. Uh, it's got a really good attack, too, because not only does the attack seem to do damage, but it also drains the person's energy because it causes so much mental uh, anxiety, so much mental stress of being clustered and crushed. Uh, as as uh, Security Guard Bob, I think his name was. Security Guard Bob, as he explained... Uh, with his dragonfly story, which was just you know, press F in the chat for Bob's dragonfly. That that was a that was a devastating moment in Grappler Baki. Anyway, uh, it has a good attack. It's got amazing defense. Uh, if somebody pulled this off in real life, they'd be practically invincible. But the fact that it's got such an easily exploitable weakness in that while you're in there, that person is completely vulnerable on the inside to things like eye gouges and they can't move they're stuck like that it's like um it's like retracting into your shell as a turtle in dungeons and dragons fifth edition you can't move so you're completely open to you know any kind of attacks that require you to be able to move uh like if somebody launched a fireball at oliva he would be fireball of <laughs> let that sink in for a second anyway um yeah you can like gouge him in the eye because he can't move his head you can stick your fingers up his nose like baki does uh it's kind of a one trick pony and uh, he's just sitting there, kind of existing, so it gives you lots of time to deal with it. Or in worst case situation, you know, if you're, <laughs> I don't know why, but if this average Joe, this stand-in, is using this to attack somebody, they can just walk away. They can just escape. It's like Superfly, right? Superfly from uh, part four of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's an insanely powerful stand, all right? Uh, Shuckmeister did an entire video explaining why uh, Superfly is the greatest stand in all of JoJo. Uh, but there's one kind of weakness of Superfly, and that's if you don't get trapped in Superfly, you can just kind of walk away. If you, like, attack Superfly for whatever reason, if somebody told you that this pylon is the strongest stand to ever exist and you want to test your might, you attack it, it reflects your attack back at you, you're like, oh, fuck, I can't beat this, and you just walk away, that's it. Superfly can't beat you because, you know, I will say Superfly is unbeatable. You can't you can't beat Superfly because, you know, in the same sense of, of Bolivar, if you get close to it, you're fucked. Um, if it, it captures you, you're fucked. And you can't really defeat it because Superfly reflects attacks and Bolivar 
reflects attacks just enough with his muscle that it completely negates the force of the attack. But at the end of the day, you you can just kind of leave. You can be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm out of my depth. Let me just back up. You know, that's good for Superfly, and that's good for Bolivar. But, uh, you know, while they're able to defend themselves, you know, they're not really able to win the fight if the person just leaves. All right, Biting. Uh, I'm going to put it in good tier. Uh, it has its weaknesses. It most certainly has its weaknesses. In real life, people are constantly talking about its weaknesses. As a matter of fact, I'm I'm considering putting it in average, but just the fact that like it's like it's like um Jack talks about in his inception of Godo when he's when he's explaining to uh uh Tokugawa why biting uh, the way of biting became his martial art. You know, a kid can beat a professional fighter if he's able to like sink his teeth into his neck. Right? Like if the fighter just stood there defenselessly, he's like, "Okay, you know, do your best, and the kid did anything but bite, the fighter would be fine at the end of it. He might be a little hurt, but he'd be fine. Now, if he's allowed to bite, then that kid's gonna kill him. He's going to sink his teeth into his neck and rip his jugular out. The kid is gonna be on some Children of the Corn type shit and murder him. So, biting is one of the human body's most powerful innate abilities, and I don't think it should be underestimated. I think that out of all the average, quote-unquote, average techniques in Baki, biting is probably one of the strongest. Like I said, it has its weaknesses. You know, you, you're leaving your jaw wide open. Baki takes advantage of that in his uh, in his fight with Jack. You know, he uh, Jack restrains both of Baki's arms, and he goes to bite Baki, and as he, you know, opens his jaw to take a bite out of Baki, Baki then folds his forearm, which is, you know, being restrained at the wrist, and elbows Jack right in the face. So, that was that was a really powerful strike that really badly hurt Jack. You know, it rocked him. So, you know, grappling has its weaknesses. Or not grappling. Rather, um, biting. Biting has its weaknesses. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, on the topic of grappling, while supplemented with grappling like Jack does with Goto, it can be even that much more devastating. But people time and time again have talked about the weaknesses of biting in martial arts. So... You know, take that with a grain of salt. I would not feel comfortable even putting it high in good, but the ability to essentially kill somebody in, like, a single motion, in that, like, you're, like, chomping their throat, that's pretty devastating. Out of all the attacks that's, like, a single use just landed and it has been used, that's pretty damn powerful. All right, the Bodhisattva Fist. I gotta say that, uh, ooh, actually, I don't know. Let me, uh, let me see. <sighs> what is Alpha Fist? Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm probably gonna say it's on the higher end of good. This one's super simple to explain. It is the perfect punch, right? Out of all the punches that have ever been in the Grappler Baki series, out of all, I don't know how many punching techniques we have down here, but out of all of them, so I don't know uh, how I got the Rikishi stance twice. Out of all the punches in the entire series, this is the perfect punch, right? Beyond that, it's not any more special. Right, it doesn't have any like special tack on ability. I, I guess you could say uh, you can use it without projecting intention, but this is real life is not like a martial arts manga, right? Average people cannot detect the inception of a martial arts technique or like an attack, right? Maybe if you wanted to make your way into combat sports and you you, you as an average Joe wanted to use the Bodhisattva, that kind of extra tack on would be useful because I, I i would be certain that martial artists and fighters on the level of people in combat sports would be able to detect the inception of an attack but other than that it it's just the perfect punch it's the strongest way you can punch with your power it's the fastest way you can punch with your speed uh it's just it's the perfect punch that's the that's the kind of catch you know, it's the perfect punch. The real Seiken, right? The the Bodhisattva Fist. So there's nothing more to it than that, but that it, that alone is enough to carry it to good, right? Probably the higher end of good, too, because it is the best punch ever, right? Mock Fist, Mock Punch, whatever you want to call it, Sunke. Uh, even the Hitless Blow. Well, yes, the Hitless Blow is stronger. It comes with drawbacks, or it's not in a technical sense. The same thing with Musunke or Sunke, in a technical sense, it's not as good, right? There will be punches 
that end up higher on the list. That's because they have some kind of special power. That being said, they will have their drawbacks as well, and you've got to kind of take it with a grain of salt, but in terms of like just a normal punch, this being a perfect example of a normal punch, that's, that's good. That's really good. I'm even tempted to put it in great, but allow me to restrain myself. Okay, the bow and arrow... I want to say it's average, but it's definitely on the higher end of average because the way Baki pulls it off, right? Uh, we, we were kind of talking about entry. Like I said, it's been like a whole day since I've talked about this move. But for example, the uh, single leg figure four. We saw how Baki used it. You know, somebody... Igari tries to... Or I don't think he tries to kick him. I think Baki, like, ankle picks him or something. But it, it would be better used as a kick defense. So let's say Igari tried a Megiri, right? Uh, he, he tries a front kick. And Baki can catch it, he loops his leg around, he stuffs the foot in the crook of his knee, and he twists around and he's got the submission part. All he has to do is secure with his other foot onto the thigh, right? So we know the entry, and that's actually, you know, there's a lot of steps to it, but that's actually a quick entry. And from that position of having your leg held up, there's not a whole lot you can do. So, especially especially with, with his back turn, like, you can't punch him in the face. If you go for a grapple, you're gonna snap your leg in half at the hip because your leg is still being grabbed. So there's not a whole lot a person can do from that position. He can try to like kick with his leg to try to get his leg loose, but that's pretty much about it. Uh, or he could like fall backwards and try to get in a grappling position, but he's still gonna end up getting single leg figure forward. But with the bow and arrow, we see that the setup is that if you're on the ground and your opponent is not, and they try to kick down, like say for instance, a stomp or a kick or whatever the case, you can kind of slip past it not not so much like passing the kick so much uh but you're kind of moving around it and then you grab it you pull the person to the floor uh so that they land face down you're kind of rolling so that their knee buckles causing them to fall face forward and then you wrap your arm around their neck and then you pull them the other way you know there are there are quite a few steps but there's nothing actually wrong with that entry that's actually a really good entry now, you'd only use it in that bad instance where you're on your back and your opponent is trying to strike down. If your opponent tries to wrestle, it's going to be a different entry and maybe more difficult to pull off. If you're not on your back on the ground, you're probably not going to use the bow and arrow. You probably could, but you're probably not going to. That's not the time and the place. So it's a bit situational, but that's probably the best situation to have a technique to counter your opponent is when you have, or when you're on the ground when you've got your back to the ground and your opponent does not, that's probably the best instance to have like a special technique waiting to be used. But beyond that, it's good because you know, you're choking the person and you're applying pressure to the spine and you've got them locked up. But other than that, you know, it's nothing really special. It's just a submission, right? So bow and arrow, it's good. It's actually a real submission. It's a submission used in real life, but it's not any more special than say, I don't know. Do we have any other submissions here? Uh, no. No, I, I would say that this is... Well, okay. We did put, like, arm lock there. Uh, do I... Should I move down my submissions, or should I move this up? I think... Oof. Well, single leg figure four is good, because that's... That's, like, in a... Well, Okay. Is it any more immediate of a submission than the bow and arrow? I think I'm gonna move down a couple of my submissions. Let me see, how many how many submissions will I have to move down? I don't think there's many. Arm lock is staying there. It's like the most reliable submission in martial arts. I think I'm gonna move down the single leg figure four to average, but it's definitely gonna end up on the higher end of average. But yeah, submissions are pretty good, but they're not anything special. So I think I'll put those there. Oh, okay, uh, apologies. This is the Antonio driver. Uh, I'm sure all of you knew that, and you were definitely yelling and screaming at me in the comments section down below. That, that's not the brain buster, that's the Antonio driver. No, no, no. No, it's fine. Easy, easy mistake, uh, but, you know, the same logic applies, right? In, in the same sense that the Antonio driver drives your Antonio right into the ground, all right? Face first, even. Uh, this one... Brain Buster. I'd say Brain Buster is probably actually the better... Well, okay. I'd say they're equal, but Antonio Driver is easier to get off because you just need to do the headlock and then fall backwards, which is a lot easier than getting in a position to use this. But the Brain Buster does more damage because you're cracking the opponent's... the back of their skull directly onto the ground. 
So I, I think these two, you know, for similar reasoning, they should both end up in good. The Buddha Stone, I think it's called. It's a Shirinji Kempo uh, technique. It's it's a it's Bukotsu. I think is it is its Japanese name. The Buddha Stone is it's basically striking the Adam's apple with a thumb. Uh, I want to say it's average because it's a good technique, but it's really difficult to land in terms of like pinpoint accuracy. So like. When he lands the technique, it's going to do what it did to Jack. Right? Actually, it would be even worse because Jack was only able to power through it because he's like freaking superhuman levels of strength and endurance. So the normal person is probably going to end up more like Roger Harlan where they get stuck in the trachea with an entire finger, like knuckle deep into their throat. They're probably going to pass out or it's going to be extremely devastating. You might even kill a person because you might like crush their trachea or something. But... You have to have the precision to land that technique. So, I don't know. You could make the argument that cutting with a foot or piercing with your toes on the level of a knife and a sword respectively, you could say that that's an issue of precision as well and that the techniques wouldn't do what we see them do. And to that I'd say that's fair. If you subscribe to that theory, then Sakuto and even Tokik would end up in average tier, probably the better half of average tier, but still average tier nonetheless. With that in mind, uh, I don't know. It, it, it just the the pinpoint precision required to get somebody in the throat in an actual fight, like with a single finger, that's that's borderline magic, <laughs> but not magic in the sense of like, oh, the technique only works if you can do a thing that no human can do in real life, right? It's magic in terms of, like, it's not the skill, it's the, or excuse me, it's not the technique, it's the level of skill of the user, which is, it has nothing to do with this list. So, I'm gonna put that on average, might even end up on the lower end of average, but at least it's better than slaps. I don't want too many things in here. I think pinch is gonna end up in here, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Anyway, camouflage. If it works like it works in the show, it's great. Holy shit, you can just turn invisible. Um, that's, that's awesome. And you can pretty much do it in any environment, too. Like, uh, Gaia does it in the sand, but I'm pretty sure it would work with, like, leaves or, like, with, like, concrete. If you were to, able to blend in with concrete, you know, whatever the case. Uh, that's busted. You can basically just turn invisible. So only people with, like, super heightened senses would be able to, like, get you. You know, you wouldn't be as silent as Gaia. You know, Gaia's uh, ability to stay silent in the situation, you know, like, not make footsteps known to his enemies or not, like shift around or whatever uh or be detected in that manner that's more so of a gaia thing so it does have its weaknesses it's not god tier uh but damn like turning invisible like like to the naked eye that's that's pretty good that's pretty good man all right um the chicken wing face lock i'm gonna put that in average it's a good submission we we see it used both in grappler baki and in uh not only the garden manga but we also see it, uh, we also have it described to us in the Garden novel because there is a manga version of the novel, not to be confused with the manga, right? The manga is done by Itagaki Kisuke, and then there's a novel written by the original author, uh, Baku, and uh, and then somebody made a manga based off of the novel. Whereas Itagaki's version, it's slightly altered. It kind of follows the same beats as the novel. But there are a lot of changes to things like character names, characters in general, some story elements, a lot of fight elements. Um, whereas the manga version of the novel follows the novel beat for beat. Um, so we, we see um, Tanba use it against uh, Soichiro? Izumi, I think is his name. The the uh, the original master of... Um, of Jujutsu that that teaches Tanba the uh, the Koo the the Tiger King technique. Uh, he uses the Chicken Wing Face Lock against him. It was great. We see Toba use it on Baki. It's great. It's not particularly a painful position to be in, but the opponent is completely locked down. There's not a whole lot they can do. Right, their arm is locked down. Uh, their face is locked down. Uh, you could probably sink a choke in from there. And it would be hard for the person to be able to resist it because it's like a one-armed choke. Uh, but it would also be hard to sink in. Uh, and their legs are locked down. One because of the other being locked down at the thigh. 
So the person's completely locked down. It's pretty good, but nothing special. The uh, Chokozuki, it's the uh, it's the best strike in modern martial arts, except um, it's not the jab is the jab is better. Uh, but this is probably the second best. Chokozuki, the straight right, is probably the second best uh, strike in modern martial arts. And that's why they, they complement each other so well. It's literally the one-two, right? Your one is your jab, your two is your straight right. Uh, or I guess straight left if if you're left-handed. But uh, your Chokuzuki is a very good technique. Uh, nothing special about it, but it's probably the second best strike in all of modern martial arts. So there you go. Chokuzuki. Very reliable, very powerful, but nothing special. Chop blow. Um... It's it, out of all the. <laughs> uh, I'm, I already know. I know. I know. I already used this joke, but out of all the strikes in modern martial arts, it's one of them. <laughs> um, let's see. Let me let me readjust myself here. Okay. <sighs> the chop blow. It's not bad. It's not really good either. It's a little bit of a, like a wild strike. Uh, I think it's listed in the the Baki technique wiki page. I think it's listed as brute force. That's that's the long and short of it. You're just kind of slamming your fist into somebody's face, um, almost haymaker style. So I, it's fine. It's just um, definitely going to be on the lower end of average because it's just kind of like you're just kind of slamming your fist into the guy's face. It's not even like a punch, right? You're just kind of slinging your fist at him so it's, it's fine but if you don't have like superhuman strength like jack it's not going to be the most amazing thing in the world okay cockroach tackle cockroach dash the goki Burra dash um i'm gonna put it in great tier right a little better than triceratops fist i'd say they're rivaling each other but i'd say this is better because while the power input is not comparable triceratops fist outputs way more power this is insanely faster um what else what else what else uh the power output is still pretty good um it's it's twin technique uh the three level attack which is only a little bit better no it's the same technique but you're introducing level change edge edge control and jabs which that that does change the game quite a bit but i'd say like this would be towards the higher end of great and this would be towards like the mid or lower end of great they would not be comparable um but in context of the entire list yeah they're they're definitely comparable uh but it's it's a, it's, it's just a great technique you know uh it's extremely fast like like i said with the three level change nobody in all of human history is going to be able to react to this because of the level at which you accelerate um and it's it's a pretty hard hitting technique i mean baki is able to break Chiharu's fingers with his eyes with the with the speed and the force at which he's generating so it's a really good technique and I don't think there's much more to say about it other than the reason why I put it above Triceratops fist is the stance is practically non-existent right the time you spend achieving quote-unquote absolute relaxation absolute exhaustion liquid liquidification you know whatever you want to call it the time in which you spend achieving that is negligible compared to the time taken to actually get into the stance of the Triceratops fist and then actually launch yourself. So, you, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of better. It's just kind of better. The, 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 the stance taking kind of negates the massive damage output in comparison to the cockroach dash. That's just my humble opinion. If you disagree, make sure to let me know in the comment section down below so I can <laughs> so I can fucking ignore it. Got him. <laughs> no, um, yeah. Yeah, I read all the comments. I just, um, when I see one that I don't really disagree with, rather than trying to argue with my fans, I just kind of, I'm like, okay, well, that's a, that's a different opinion. Time to move on. Um, uh, cord cutter. Also, you guys are giving me, uh, interactivity. In the comment section, so I still win. You're, if you disagree with me, you're you're making my <laughs> you're making my video more popular by letting me know. So thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, you're a real one. Anyway, cord cutter, it's got its weaknesses. Baki took advantage of its weakness. Kosho then um, overcame its weakness. Uh, then Shibukawa grabbed his finger. Finger grab is not better than cord cutter, by the way. That that's a difference between Shibukawa and Kosho. 
uh, with their with their pinpoint accuracy. It's another instance of pinpoint accuracy. Um, cord cutter is really good. If somebody like Yujiro used cord cutter, uh, he'd kill every single person he ever fought. Right? Uh, it's just that devastating. Right? You you could cause permanent damage in a single strike. Uh, devastating damage in a single strike. Uh, he made Baki half blind. Uh, he removed use of his arm. He made Kureha blind, and Kureha would have lost had it not been for the fact that he could reattach his nerves because he's like a super doctor. Uh, and Baki made Jack half blind, which left him insanely open for a lot of attacks like the Gotai Jutsu or the Mock Fist. Uh, just, just a, it's a very devastating technique, and that's not even the full application. That's just one of many applications that Cord Cutter has. So it's a, it's a great technique. It's amazing, right? This is like, you know, if you wanted to argue that Sakuto and Toe Kick, they're only good uh, in, in terms of, like, cutting or piercing, like, weapons because of Dopo's precision and Dopo's technical skill, if you wanted to make that argument, that's fine. But cord cutter, cord cutter, that's literally how it works. Yes, it's a product of uh, Kosho strengthening his fingers. But under the assumption that we're using the technique, it would literally not be possible to properly use the technique unless you could pierce a person and then pull out their their uh, cords, so to speak, their arteries, their veins, their ligaments, all those things. It's so devastating. It's insanely powerful as a technique, but it does have its weaknesses. It does have its drawbacks, you know. Nothing's perfect, except except for this. This is kind of perfect. <laughs> it has its drawbacks, but in the real world, uh, the, the drawbacks pretty much don't exist. So it's pretty much the perfect technique in a kind of Joe Schmo using it in the real world kind of setting. It's it's pretty much a perfect technique. Uh, that's why it cannot be done in real life. I mean, a lot of these can't be done in real life, but most of them are exaggerated. This is massively exaggerated in the point that while the 0.5 second unconscious exists in real life, this technique allows you to do something that no human in real life would ever be capable of doing. So that's where the, the, the that's where the distinct difference is. Like people can do this, it's just not as powerful. People can do this, it's just not as reliable. People can do this, except maybe that. <laughs> people can do this, except not as fast. People level change all the time in real life. Somebody could probably manage this, but it wouldn't be nearly as effective as shown. Uh, this, I don't know if people could do it in real life, but it's just really good. Um, uh, people do this in real life all the time. It's, of course, just not as effective. This, uh, people kind of do this with, like, sprinting and stuff. The kind of relaxation, uh, to, to, like, snap your muscles. Equaling speed. And, of course, um, again, this is kind of a case of Udande where it's not really possible, but it's just that good. It's on the higher end of good techniques, uh, in, like, a fictional sense. All right, the mighty scissors, uh, the the kind of the leg lock or like the I forget what it's called in real life. Uh, it's it's average. It's a good takedown technique, especially if you're on the ground and a person is not. Uh, I don't know. It's like uh, if you're if you're a grappler, especially if you're a ground grappler, like a wrestler or a Brazilian jiu jitsu, or if you're good at uh, judo ne waza, it's a technique you're you're gonna want to have, right? Um, because uh, there's no guarantee that. Your opponent is going to go down before you. You know, you can have all your throws and all the takedowns in the world, but they don't do you much good if you happen to make it to the ground before your opponent. This this kind of changes that. I mean, hell, even Cosmo does it. Uh, I forget I forget who he's fighting, but he does it at one point in the series himself uh, in Kengen Ashura. So it's a good technique for any wrestler to have, or any grappler, I should say. All right, the decapitating or the cross-decapitating arm lock. Uh, I think, I think we've pretty much established that submissions, just normal submissions, are average. It allowed the Sambo homie to, uh, to pretty much take Andreas Reagan down to the ground and finish him off. Uh, it's, it's good, you know, you kind of choke the person, you're, you've got a really secure arm lock, and of course, uh, you know, the arm bar, it's, it's, it's always gonna be good. Uh, but other than that, it's it's just kind of normal. It, I guess you could say it's going to end up on the higher end of average because oh, it's a it's an arm bar and it's a choke because of the the decapitating aspect of it. But eh, it's fine, I guess. Um, not kick, crotch kick. What can I say about this? Uh, okay. I guess I could put it in average. 
Actually, you know what? It's pretty it's pretty good. Uh, out of all the strikes in the series, it's pretty devastating because well, you're like n n mashing the nuts, you know? Well, I, I don't know. Uh, the way it's used in the series, it's, it's actually pretty great. You know, when you think about it. Well, actually, you know what? Just because of how powerful it is in the series, I'm thinking it might even be... Oh, oh, actually, there's a, there's, <laughs> there's a dedicated tier for it. There you go. It's such an amazing technique. All right, let me explain to you how broken the crotch kick, the Kentucky Geary is. Okay? Anytime anything happens, kick him in the balls. All right? You're fighting, uh, let's see. Let's see. You're, uh, you're, you're fighting Hanayama. Kick him in the balls. He's done. All right? It happened to uh, Zulu. Zulu beat Baki. He beat him. Nobody can take that away from him. Zulu, he doesn't have much of a presence in the series, but nobody can take away from him the fact that he defeated Baki Hanma. And it was, a, it was a fair fight, too. Baki wasn't ready. Yeah, well, Tokugawa lectured him about his four cardinal behaviors, and he accepted it. He was like, I took the L. If Baki is willing to accept it, and I understand he's humble, he's not willing to take his victory over Yujiro because he doesn't feel like he earned it. I got it. I understand. But, crotch kick. Crotch kick solves all the problems. It's like, oh, Zulu just beat me five seconds ago. Crotch kick! Kick him in the balls! Nut masher! It's done. It's over. Awarida. It's over. All right? The crotch kick, all right? All of these techniques have weaknesses, but not the crotch kick. Every single time it's been used, 100% efficacy, 100% knockout rate, all right? Baki just doesn't crotch kick everybody he fights because it would be too easy, okay? Let's think about it, right? Ali Jr. stepped to him. He did not He did not appreciate the disrespect. He said, you disrespect me in front of my girl, trying to get her to marry you. You disrespect me by uh, in front of all these people, trying to take my title. I'm going to kick you in the balls. And he does, and he defeats Ali Jr. in a single strike. Dopo and Shibukawa, they were, they were out there talking all that mess about, oh, Ali Jr. is going to win. He's hungry. He's hungry. And Baki said, <laughs> he's hungry for these fucking nuts. And he smashes his nuts in with his foot. All right. And as you can see here, it's omnidirectional. You can literally mash them nuts from any direction. I don't, I don't understand how anybody can like seriously look me in the eye and say, I don't know, uh, the, the demon back or the dark tunnel or the tunnel or whatever. The Mawashi Uke, whatever. Now you can look at any of these techniques and think they're better than the than the, the crotch kick, the Kentucky Geary. Anyway, anyway, I I, I I think I'm I'm preaching to the choir. Honestly, I'm arguing to nobody because there's not going to be anybody in the comment section that's like, well, actually, Christian Red Fox, this technique is better because. Shut up. Shut up. Nobody cares what you have to say. I don't even want the engagement. From your comment, just just take that idea you just had in your head and throw it in the trash because nobody cares. Anyway, Crushing Fist. Crushing Fist is actually really good. Don't sleep on Crushing Fist. Um, Crushing Fist is probably one of the better counters in the entire series. It's not Udande level, but the fact that... Um, I mean, j just look at what Retsu did to Pickle. Pickle was, like, vehemently like assaulting him. Right? He was he was objectively much stronger than Retsu. But Retsu was able to very badly injure Pickle with a single strike because he's able to counter in a way that causes the attacker's strength to be reflected back onto them. Now that's not to say that he didn't take any damage, but rather the strength of the punch was enhanced by the fact that Pickle was moving into it. It's a real-life technique, the Crushing Fist. Uh, I can't remember all the details of it, but I, I found out about it uh, a little while ago. I looked it up one day. I was like, what is this? Is this based off of, like, a real thing, or is this, like, not real? It's real. It's a real attack. It's not as effective in real life, but that idea of striking somebody that's moving into you, that's that's prevalent in pretty much every martial art. Uh, so I would say it's probably on the better half of good. Uh, in real life, I'd probably say it's on the higher end of average or maybe the lower end of good. Uh, not so much the real life technique as it is, but rather that idea of striking a person moving into you. Uh, maybe that, maybe I would couple that te technique into that general concept, but um, 
in terms of how it's shown in Baki, uh, it's definitely going to end up mid to high good. All right. Tunnel, I don't think anybody can argue that Tunnel is... I think I'm about to argue that Tunnel is not great. <laughs> Tunnel is not great. Tunnel is good. Tunnel is a one-hit KO. It's a one-hit kill. Uh, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. If it happens to you, you're fucked. You're dead. That's it. There, you, there's no hope for you. You cannot be healed in any way. Uh, you cannot prevent it from happening to you. You're just gonna fucking die if it's perfectly executed onto you. But the situation in which you'd actually be able to use it is so niche that unless you were literally like an assassin by trade or like a spy, you'd never be able to use it, ever. You can't use it in an actual fight. You can't use it in like a combat sports situation. You 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 just can't you can't use it. You can't use it unless there's a chair, a a, a person you want to kill sitting in that chair, and that person being unaware of your presence. It's just a, it's not even like you you could show up to every fight you go into with a chair, like on some Karapika shit when he fought Uvogin and he showed up with the shovel. It's not like one of those badass moments where you're like I brought this shovel along because I'm going to kill you. It's like, I'm so certain of my victory that I brought this shovel so I can bury you. No, you're bringing a chair along, you're like, sit in this chair so that I can hide in this chair so that when you sit down, I can cut your asshole open and crawl through your body. It's just, uh, it's, it's just, it's a really good technique in effect. It's just one of those nigh impossible to pull off techniques. Alright, this is the Dashinage. I'm gonna say this on the lower end of good. Right, um... Dashinage in real life is a pretty pretty useful uh, Kimarite. One of the uh, the 96 winning techniques is 48 and their reverse. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a pretty good Dashinage. It's a pretty good uh, throw, right? You're using the momentum of your opponent to throw them. Uh, it's, it's a very basic concept in things like Jujutsu and Judo and Aikido. All these techniques or all these uh, martial arts that were spawned from Sumo. Uh, it's good. How Shibukawa uses it is a little difficult, because you'd have to have the pre precision to shove your fingers up somebody's nose, but if you're able to pull that off, it's pretty good. So it's kind of like Tunnel Light, right? It's not as devastating to pull off, but it's definitely nowhere near as impossible to pull off in a live combat situation. So I'd say Dashinage is pretty good. It's pretty good, as, as seen in Baki. In real life, I'd actually say it's even better, because it's it may be less, less potent, but it's definitely way more reliable. It's way easier to pull off, right? Maybe maybe not for somebody of Shibukawa's stature fighting somebody like Kyoge. It may not be as useful as the Dashinage he uses, but I'm pretty sure that's why he used the one he used as opposed to the one that is typically used, right? We already know that he's a master of uh, Aiki Jujutsu. He's a master of uh, Judo. He's a master of Sumo. We know that he's mastered all these um, different styles that would properly use Dashinage, so we know he's not using it in this modified form because he doesn't know how to pull it off normally. He's pulling it off like this because that's the most effective way he could have used it. But that's that's a Shibukawa thing, not a technique thing. Dashinage as seen in Baki, it's it's okay, it's good. It's good enough. All right, the Dashin, uh, assuming it works. Uh damn, I I'd say great. I'd say great. You can you can just kind of hit somebody in the chest and they cannot move. They are paralyzed for X amount of minutes. That's that's really good. That is actually really super good. From that position, you can choke them out. You can submit them. You can knock them out. It's it's almost as good as uh, 0 0.5 second unconscious. Because 0 0.5, con or 0 0.5 second unconscious gives you that free hit as well. But the difference between them is Dashinage. You have to do something. You have to land the strike. Right? You do have to actually do something. With 0 0.5 second unconscious, you don't actually have to do anything. Your opponent just is unconscious for half a second while reacting to something, and then you can just choose not to be. So, I guess if you were to put it into perspective, uh, I know I keep coming back to Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, it's because I always make Dungeons & Dragons Grappler Baki uh, homebrew classes. This would be an action. You'd be making an unarmed strike against somebody, and if they fail a very high constitution saving throw, they're paralyzed for a turn, which that that's fabulous, right? Uh, or until the end of their next turn, because you can take another action before they're able to do anything, right? So not only do you get, like, dogpiled by all your allies, but you get to take an attack action on the person before they're able to recover. 
Uh, with this, this is a free action. This just happens, right? So that, that's really good. It, 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 as a matter of fact, I wouldn't even say it's a free action. Like I said, it just happens, right? So even if you didn't come first in initiative in this example, right? If we're using the Dungeons & Dragons initiative system, you can just kind of say, nah, I'm going to go ahead and skip your turn. You don't get to do anything this round. It's like a surprise round, but he is very clearly aware of your presence. So this one's definitely the better version of this one, but I think Dashin, for what it does, deserves great tier. Uh, sh <laughs> Defensive showery. Uh, boys. <sighs> it's, that's really fucking good. It has, it like, like, uh, 0 0.5 second unconscious. It has its weaknesses. But for somebody, even like Retsu, who has not mastered it to the level of Kaku's mastery. For somebody like Retsu to be able to take no damage from a sword slash from Miyamoto Musashi. Right? Granted, Musashi was using swords that he deemed inferior to his own katana. But regardless, Musashi, using swords, could not cut Retsu because of his Shaori. I think we gotta put it in God tier. It has its weaknesses, because, you know, it's got like the, oh, if you are scared, or like, if you like pull a hair, it causes your body to tense up and you can be struck. Um, well, what are the other weaknesses? If you're slammed into something, you can't relax through it because the force will just be pushed right back into you. Uh... I feel like there's another weakness that I'm forgetting. Oh yeah, downward strikes. If somebody strikes you downward, like for instance an axe kick, because the the force won't be able to travel into the like it won't be able to pass through you. It'll it'll get stopped by the ground, and then that force will basically resound back through. It, you know, it has its weaknesses. It has about the same amount of weaknesses as this one. This one has attacking faster or attacking with higher acceleration. Um. Being able to uh, react on instinct. And... There's a third one. I can't remember what it is. Um, this also has three weaknesses, but they're both so damn good. You would... It, with this, you would basically become invincible. In real life. Your average Joe, you would not be able to be hurt. You could fight somebody like 3,000 weight classes above you. Could not hurt you. You would become the champion of every single UFC weight division. Because you would never you'd never be able to take damage. It would be insane. Now somebody could take you to the ground and then that kind of negates that that bonus. But showery is not just one technique. Right? You can only learn defensive showery, but most people are able to manage well, okay, I say that, but there's like two people. Well, three people that can pull off showery and two of them only know defensive so far as we've seen i'm pretty sure yujiro can do offensive showery but he doesn't need to anyway it has its weaknesses like if you're taken to the ground i'm pretty sure he he wouldn't be able to manage to grapple uh somebody with uh defensive showery but i, I guess if you did you could do something there not sure i might be convinced to change this by the end but as it stands that in invincibility to all striking attacks that is nuts! That is insane! Anyway, uh, destructive force is average. Because if you're just a normal person, and you're not Hanayama, if you're just a normal person, it's just a normal punch. Uh, the back suplex... Mm, it's pretty easy to get off. It's pretty... It's pretty easy to pull off the technique. Um... But, I mean, there's really not much to it, so I guess it's fine, but I can't see it getting very high in average. Dress. Dress is great. Dress, I'm putting in a great tier. Uh, yeah, great tier. Uh, that's such a devastating throw grapple technique. I don't, I don't think you need much of an explanation, right? If you can pull it off as seen in Baki, that, uh, that's, that's ludicrous. Uh, that is easily one of the best techniques in Baki in terms of, like, a physically offensive attack. Damn, that is really good. Uh, drop kick. Average. It's no different than it is in real life, and in real life it's okay. Uh, if you miss, you have, uh, just given up so much position. You're on the ground, and that person's going to 
tackle you and then grapple you, or they're going to stomp on you and kick you. You're on the ground and your opponent is not, and also you just drop to the ground as though you basically threw yourself, so uh, that's a high risk, high reward. It's like the high jump kick in Pokemon. You just don't want to risk it. Uh, Earth Theory is good. It's basically just a damage boost to your attacks, like a free damage boost as long as you're standing on the ground. That's, that's pretty great. Endorphins. Endorphins are great. They just allow you to not feel damage. They allow you to just kind of power through all all pain. And uh, and they give you like a special energy boost. That's, that's pretty great. Not as great as adrenaline because adrenaline actually makes you stronger and faster. But that's pretty a, a pretty close second in terms of brain drug techniques. Invisible squash. I'd say that's I'd say that's great actually. Uh, it allows you it, it doesn't do any damage, but it allows you to uh, blind your opponent. So literally, if you used invisible squash, you know for your average Joe, they're not used to being hit in the eyeball with a, with a fucking air bullet. Uh, all uh, you know, Yujiro just pulled off to Kehaya the second. Just, just did an invisible squash. The man was blinded for a second, and then he almost got his testicles introduced to the back of his throat. Uh, with this, you can pretty much pull off any of these techniques, because it blinds the person, briefly, momentarily. Now, that's not to say it works multiple times, because Baki was able to avoid getting invisible squashed in the conclusion of uh, Retsu versus Baki in the Maximum Tournament, but all things considered, I think it's pretty north of good. I think we can all agree that being able to blind somebody from pretty much any distance uh, and then being able to close that distance and pull off an attack or do whatever you want to do in that time that they're momentarily blinded I think that's that's I think we can all agree that's north of good right that's that's kind of like cord cutter but it has better range it's just not as reliable okay the eye ground crush uh I'll say it's good because you're able to blind the person with your hand, but you do have to sacrifice your hand in order to hurt the person. That's pretty self-explanatory. It's kind of like Invisible Squash, but while you do do damage, uh, you also smash your own fucking hand into pieces. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. Uh, it's also a fight ender, though, to be fair, because most of the time you're going to crack the person's orbital bone, which is what he was going for there. And it only didn't work on Shibukawa because he happened to have a glass eye. That, that freak coincidence saved him from losing to Kosho, right? Now, I will say this. Most people are like, oh, if if not for that coincidence, Kosho would have won. I'm pretty sure Shibukawa wouldn't have let it get to that point if he was concerned about Kosho being able to actually defeat him. But, you know, different strokes for different folks. People will disagree. Uh, forehead blow is trash. It's so bad. It's bad in Baki. <laughs> It's bad in Baki. It's so bad that the only person that can use it is the only person in the series that doesn't mind having his face obliterated. Okay? It's a bad technique. It's like it's like it's like Chiharu took the headbutt technique, which is just an average technique. We'll get to it. It's average. It's a pretty good strike. Um there are very few martial arts that'll let you headbutt. Uh, like Lethway. Lethway is seen as a pretty hardcore martial art just because it allows you to headbutt people. But, God, he took headbutts and he made them worse. Oh my God, it's such a bad technique. You you basically smash your face into another person's face or body or whatever. It's just it's just not good. Fanes. Fanes are great. Fanes are probably the only real-life technique that will surpass good tier. Because they're so important. Feigning is pretty much how you land any technique that you would not be able to land straight up. I, I don't think I need to explain why feigns are great, but just know that 90% of all martial arts probably wouldn't work without feigns. Or at the very least, the stuff that does work, works so much better because of feigns. Right? It's a it's an integral part of hand-to-hand -hand combat, or, or combat in general, to be able to feign people. Right? Make them think that you're attacking one spot when you're actually attacking another. That's just straight up. That's on some Art of War type shit. Alright? Anyway, um... The finger grab. Average. People do it in real life. It's kind of hard to get your hands on somebody's finger. If you can, then that's great. But pain compliance is kind of unreliable. Uh, the finger grab. Having the precision to grab somebody's finger. Pretty difficult. The only way you're really going to manage to do it in real life is by indexing. What indexing is, is basically you grab the person's shoulder or their arm 
and you move your way down. That's actually pretty easy. Uh, actually cinching the finger from indexing, it's kind of difficult, but it's way easier than trying to just straight up grab somebody's finger. So and it's probably going to end up on the lower end of average, probably uh, higher than Bukotsu, because that, that level of precision is just un unreal. It's inhuman. But uh, yeah, it's fine, I guess. It's, it's, it's impressive for what it is. Uh, the five consecutive vital points attack, I think it's called. Um, pretty great, actually. It's five consecutive attacks, which in of itself is pretty good. I'd say if, if it was just five attacks, it'd, it'd be in good tier. But the fact that it's five consecutive attacks that specifically focus on attacking vital points... So it's five vital point consecutive attack. That I think that bumps it up to great tier. Because Katsumi, who is weaker than Pickle by a significant margin, is able to do devastating damage five times in a row consecutively without Pickle being able to so much as sneeze. That's that's pretty damn good. Let's see, how many do we have left? Uh two, four, five. So we have about like 50 left, I think. Maybe a little north of 50. Uh, I think we're gonna have to save this for a 